right, um, for me start now, I would like to welcome um, our participants and our distinguished guests for being present here today for the International Symposium on, on Role of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development. Before we start, I would like to formally thank um, our distinguished scholars that have traveled from Brook University here and uh, are here to give us uh, specific expert lectures on this uh, important topic of basic sciences and its work for sustainable development. I would like to uh, thank Professor Ijaz Ahmed, who is Professor and Dean of the Faculty of Mathematics and Sciences, Professor Ping Yang, Professor, Department of Biological Sciences, Center of Biotechnologies, Professor Georgi Nikonov, Professor, Chemistry Department, and Professor Kirill Samokhan, Professor, Department of Physics. I would also like to thank Dr. Ali Mani, who will be giving a virtual lecture, who's, a, who's the Assistant Professor from the Department of Computer Sciences. Before we begin with the program, I would like to introduce um, the, uh, the OIC Technology and Innovation Portal to our guests and our participants. Um, OIC uh, and Comsec have basically come up with a digital platform <coughs> where um, researchers, students, universities, um, commercial businesses, they can um, display their products and services to a digital platform. This platform caters for 57 member states of the OIC world, and we invite exhibition in various schools, various different areas such as information technologies, natural sciences, biosciences, energy, environment, and climate change. Um, this portal basically caters to two types of users, one that are looking for a specific product or service in a, any specific field, um, and it can be um, specific to any single country. Um, we have different um, thematic areas um, sorted down here, according to which an uh, individual can basically look up any uh, specific service or uh, products in a specific area or in a specific country. We also have um, uh, further um, reduced it to either with the whether you're looking for a prototype level uh, product or a commercial level. Product. The second user uh, that caters to this uh, portal is those that want to display their products. For example, now, um, you're heading your own departments, and if you wish your services, your products, your research to be displayed here, a simple profile will be made, uh, which is authenticated in 48 hours, and all of your products and uh, your services can be listed there, which will then be um, displayed to 57 member states of the OIC. So that is our uh, OIC technology and innovation portal. With that, I would like to formally begin with today's symposium. And I would like to welcome, I would like to request um, His Excellency Professor Dr. Mamadi Kaal Shoshi, sure. Coordinator yes. General Council for his presentation. Thank you very much. We are taking time for like to see some people uh, in the morning hours, and I'm sure there are many in the evening hours also. And uh, that is what technology can offer us. Uh, so we can really be in real time talk to so many people. Uh, this uh, symposium uh, on role of basic sciences for sustainable development is very, very close, very close to my heart. I am a scientist with interest and understanding and appreciation of basic science. And I really do appreciate why it is important that we all strive to strengthen basic science capacity in uh, our countries. Uh, you see, uh, what, whatever you see today in terms of technological development has never been the objective of curiosity driven science. I mean, Today, you may find many companies driving to develop new technology for money, but the science behind those technologies has never been for the money. Isn't it true? You know, so from the time of uh, Telus to Plato, from Yellen to Bacon, from uh, Messina to uh, Al Biruni, all these medieval scientists, the old ancient science has been largely curiosity driven. In the sake of knowledge. And that is the basic fundamental driving force of science, even today. Also. We don't really work for money, we work for learning and understanding of what nature is all about. All around us, the science of understanding 
or what natural phenomena are applied to planets and, and cosmos body and others, they all are fundamental aspect of life. And uh, that is what eventually convert, that knowledge eventually convert to technology, and technology bring money, technology bring uh, pleasure, technology bring comfort, technology bring efficiency and other things. But it's always a technology, technology has limitations. I can give you an example of, uh, of medical science. Uh, we have exhausted all technology that presented drugs, medical devices, biomedical devices, and others. Now, uh, basic sciences of how to generate human cells and then convert them into tissues and then tissues into organs would eventually lead to a new science, new medical system called regenerative therapy. Uh, similarly, the world has now we have reached to the stage of a climate change. And we know technology has been a main driving force of, of climatic change in our how to get, handle these technological devastations related to overuse of technology, the basic science would eventually come into the force. They will come and play a very important role. And that is where I feel so extremely strong uh, about this. The reason why we are not able to develop applied sciences and technology because of our foundation in basic sciences is extremely weak. Why we are not able to produce Nobel laureates? You know why? Because the fact is that basic conceptual foundation of sciences such as chemistry, physics, mathematics, and biology are very, very easy. As a result of it, you can't really build a magnif magnificent, magnificent uh, building on superficial foundation. And that is where the Comsec has decided to launch this program on basic science. So he has basic science program. This is a basic science uh, uh, year of basic sciences. We all understand there is a gross appreciation. We need to go back and learn from the natural those sciences. Without that, we will not be able to break the ceiling. We will not be able to go to the to, to develop new technologies, to develop technologies which are friendly to environment and climate, which is also the enduring problems of, uh, of uh, humanity. And that is where Comstock would like to come. So in our program, which is led by my colleague, we are trying to engage very high quality basic scientists, you know, people who work for people of fundamental sciences, and provide them platforms so they can help in strengthening the capacity of the other people. Remember, there is no uh, other joy more enjoyable than learning new things. It is kind of a love affair, you know, which gives you so much of a pleasure of learning new things. And then we have these two, uh, three, uh, four uh, distinguished scholars physically present and one will come online from a very prestigious institution and happen to visit this uh, university, Brock University. Um, we have uh, Professor Jas with us, who is uh, a frequent visitor of Pakistan. Certainly, among the top uh, mathematician and statistician, we have Professor Georgi Nikonov. So, thank you very much for coming. Uh, Professor Pinya, thank you, sir, for coming. And uh, uh, Professor Phil Sanke. And of course, we will have uh, one more guest who will be coming online uh, with the background of the whole science. I want to take, I don't want to take uh, all of the time, I just want to give you one message, very strongly out that without developing a strong foundation of basic sciences, without understanding your subject to the core of it, without developing a strong foundation of science, you will not be able to go anywhere. Let me assure you that you may have, uh, you know, you become professor or whatever, you would only be able to excel in your discipline if you are strong on the foundation. And that is the objective of the story. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you very much, sir, for your remarks. So, for our first technical talk, I would like to now invite Professor Ijaz Ahmed to give his talk on sustainable development, statistical challenges, and opportunities. Please, sir. Thank you, geologist. So, yeah, just hold that. Yes, sir, please. Okay. All right. Sorry. Yes, uh, first of all, Bismillah name. And uh, thank you to Dr. Edward for the invitation and for organizing this important workshop and recognizing the, the importance of basic science, as you mentioned. You know, if we don't have the basic knowledge, we cannot go to the advanced one. So we, in science, it's a, it's, a, it's a building up, it's a process. You know, in, in some other subject, for example, I take the history of Europe and then I take the history of Asia, they are not connected. The science courses, they are connected. So we, if we develop, we accumulate the knowledge, we build the knowledge. So we cannot just take a third year chemistry level course without knowing the first year. So it's very important that uh, we invest some time and on the basic science and then we branch out as, as we wish, wherever you want to go. But basic knowledge is very important. So this is a joint talk with uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Richard Chiel. Uh, he's a earth scientist. So when uh, Dr. Walt asked me to speak on this thing, I said, I'm not much in sustainability, so, so I, I need some help. But on the other hand, I'm a statistician or data scientist. So as you know, we are in the backyard of everybody. So whatever you guys do, you collect the data. And then you need us to, 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 to analyze the data. And, 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 and go from there. So I would uh, talk about the, what are the challenges for, for a statistician, because you know, we are in a big data era. It's, we have massive data and also in, in, in sustainability area. So what a beautiful world we had or, or we still have it and what we're going to do with it. So if you look at the early human could satisfy their needs with minimal impact on their environment. So they are really environmental friendly people, our ancestors. So look at them and look at us. We think we are more smart, we are more good looking or, or, or many other things, but they were the smartest people. They kept the earth in a, in a good shape for us and what we are doing. And also, you know, we can blame uh, the more advanced countries they are the cause for all this problem, but we are all participating in that cause. So, but now our needs is enormous. So can our motherland take it? So they could farm or hunt and move on the landscape would soon return to its natural steps. So they were moving around it's like tribes going one place to other place. So whatever they use the resources, that resources are coming back natural. But what we are doing now, that's the question. So these are all pictures are from public domain taken from there. I'm not an artist. So today the global population is approaching almost 8 billion people who occupy about 48% of the land surface, 48%. Human activity is complex, very complex. 
and on a global scale has caused long-term damage to the environment in a wide variety of ways, which we are observing and which we are seeing it and listening about it, but what we are doing about it, that's the most important thing. And to me, you know, I say, oh, as an individual, what can I do? No, one person can make a difference. And then you become the example, you become the role model, and people will follow the course. So for century, we assumed that Earth was an intending provider of resources and a vast sponge. Everything will be absorbed. That's not true. That could absorb everything that we did it to by now. The scale of human demand, we, have, we want more and more. And, and we are using more and more resources. And we are not thinking our, for our coming generation. Exceeded the Earth's ability. Now we are going to go to Mars for mining to sustain a healthy planet on which population can thrive. So, so it's, it's a very serious issue. So science and science education, as Dr. Bal already mentioned, are the most important means of ensuring a successful and sustainable future for humanity. So she mentioned about technology being this and there, prosperity, everything else, and the quality of life we are, we are having because of the basic sciences. So fundamental scientific research provides the pool of knowledge from which solutions are formed. So many problems we have solved, for example, DNA things. We have coded many, many of those secrets without science education to train the scientists of the future the creation of new knowledge will cease and pull of that knowledge will dry up. You know, you can't just rely on on few basic theory forever. So some new theories has to come. Some new knowledge has to come. It should be continuous. There should be pipeline. And pipeline cannot be dry. The day the pipeline dry, we are all in trouble. So Benjamin Franklin, he said, when the well is dry, we will know the worth of the water. So abundance of water, abundance of things. So we don't value it, but the one, they are gone, then we will know and it may be too late. So science will create the new knowledge and science education will make that knowledge accessible to population. So it's not only science, science education is itself important because not everybody will become scientists, but we should be able to provide the science knowledge to, to ordinary human beings. So innovate changes to our interaction with the earth from and that we require the so is a consumption. We are consuming, become a consumer society. So when I left Pakistan 35, 40 years ago, so I felt that uh, over there is the consuming society. But now I come to many developing or emerging countries, it's all consumption, consumption, consumption. And as again, I will mention, Dr. Iqbal mentioned about the curiosity. Curiosity is very important. And the government or, or even the private enterprise should fund human curiosity. If we are not curious, we will never invent anything. So human curiosity and creativity are absolutely necessary to generate knowledge. If our forefather or ancestor was not curious, we were not sitting over here. And that will lead to sustainable development. So now we have to understand it's not the creation and creativity, but how to sustain it in such a way. So we just had a, a, a Brock University, we have international forum on, on sustainable mining. Mining is important, it, so we need mining, but how we can make a mining sustainable? So those kind of questions science can answer and can tell us. So sustainable development or any scale must be guided by understanding of the outcomes. So that's very important. Somehow our leader or managers or whatever you call them, they have no idea about it, the outcomes of our actions. So they, it's, it's, you know, it's action, reaction, physics, all law is there on the many components of on the earth system. So we are doing things, but we don't know what will be the outcomes of this. Such planning relies on our ability to understand the air system, the components which will be impacted by human activities. To able to predict, that's where 
I come into the picture. You know, when you want to buy a house, they talk about location, location, location. For me, prediction, prediction, prediction. We must predict before we do, we take the action. What would happen? After taking the action, prediction has no meaning. It's like a, you are after the election, you are predicting the results. No use. So this is uh, Rick Shield provided with this slide. Look at the our system, how complex it is. It could be more complex than what we are seeing here, but it doesn't matter. What they say, complex problem, simple solution. So if we show this kind of complexity to our political leaders and other things, they will get lost. As a scientist, we need, we must provide simple solution to complex problems. So the earth system and our interaction with uh, it, very complex. We all know it. Complexity is the part of the, the problem and part of the solution as well. So how we are doing the mining, drill, drill, baby drill. So the vice president of uh, the candidate for the vice president, Sarah Palin, she used to say drill, drill, drill. And then what will be the outcome? Can we predict the the outcome. And look at this. It, it's, it's, it's not a one place. It has been going over and over to different places. We must minimize our environmental impact with modern technologies. But how the modern technology will come? Through the basic sciences. So only through the science discovery and education, we will be able to identify. So identification is the first issue. If we don't identify the problem, how we will find a solution? And most of us in our society, many countries, we refuse to identify the problem. Forget about the, the environment. Any problem, we first we refuse. We become very defensive right away. So that's not going to help. So understanding the earth system in sufficient detail, we have to learn it in, in very detail. So again, my favorite word, to allow prediction of the outcomes of our actions relies on science. So now you hear the word data science. So mm -hmm. data is, is becoming a, a discipline of, of, of science of already become. So most important, I mean, in, in a random order, because I have a biologist here, I have a chemist here, <laughs> and a computer science coming, so they will get after me. So I don't want that problem. So it is in a random order, biology, chemistry, so I have a, I'm a Dean Faculty of Math and Science. It's all departments are there. Actually, I'm talking about my faculty, computer science, data science, geology, which nowadays we call earth sciences, mathematics, physics, statistics, and, and all related fields with that. And through intra and transdisciplinary works by researcher, this discipline will improve our understanding. So we cannot be solo anymore. We have to work together. It's a collaborative thing. So I use the word transdisciplinary. In the, so you, you, you have heard the interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary between two departments. Multidisciplinary, maybe faculties level at university. Transdisciplinary, you are going everywhere. And the, the, we in Canada, we have a highway one. It's called uh, transdisciplinary highway one. It goes to each part of Canada. It start from east to west and pass through all the eight provinces. So it has to be transdisciplinary. So we have to gain knowledge. It's not just deep knowledge. It has to be also wide. So domain knowledge versus subject knowledge. So both are important. But the what ratio, you determine yourself. So the understanding will form the basis for predicting how the earth system will respond to all our actions as we pursue new commercial activities. Because basically, it has it will be commercialized in the end. So how we prevent? So predicting the human impact on the Earth system requires analysis of massive amounts of data. So nowadays we call big data, and this data is not only big; it's also complex. This analysis requires mathematics, of course, and particularly creative statistics that can deal with the huge and very complex data sets. New algorithms. So computer science come into the, we need coding. 
So new algorithms and even new mathematical and statistical strategies will be needed to model. So we first have to be, we have to model the problem, the model will have parameters, we estimate them, and then we do the prediction. So modern statistics will provide the tools that allow us to predict the outcomes. But on the other hand, I'm just uh, being a statistician, I'm biased towards the statistics. So I would all of you to become a statistician or data scientist, and also very lucrative job nowadays. They are making more money than whatever. <laughs> I don't want to mention anyway. So, but no, we, and then even becoming a statistician, we need to have a more domain knowledge and subject knowledge. So we should know what's bioinformatics, is, what's going in biology, what's going in NMR, in, in chemistry, how they are collecting data. How, so if we, without that knowledge, our data analysis, we will be not feel good about it. We'll just do like a machine robot. So we need to understand all the other areas. So we have to find the ways to minimize the negative impacts. And it's possible. It's, 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 it, it's not that difficult. So wind power is one of the cleanest and most readily available source of power drive commercial activities. So, so this is there, sustainable. In the most of recent proliferation of different alternative fuels, wind power is found to be one of the most attractive options. So there are options. Maybe there are some other options. We don't know yet. So however, a significant obstacle to its implementation is the difficulty in predicting the distribution of wind space. Now you can see where I'm going. Uh, over time, in order to evaluate the power production potential for a given area. So we need to model the data, we need to do the prediction and see how we can do the best. So wind power has been the fastest growing renewable power source around the globe with an average annual growth about 30%, more than 30%, and exponentially increase in some countries, for example, Germany, Spain, Portugal, UK and Italy. So there are some differences out there. And the New York Times, it's a 2008 article, mentioned that the dirty secret of clean energy is that while generating, it is getting easier, generation easier, but moving to market is not. So we have to find, find the solution. So here, uh, when I, if, uh, Dr. Iqbal asked us to do this thing, I said, did I do some work? So, you know, sometimes you do research, you forget, you move on. So in 2016, I had this joint paper and actually with my Russian friend, Yulia, and Anubovich, it's a catching uncertainty of a wind, a blend of sea post trap and new switching models. It's, it's quite a mathematically intensive model. I will not talk about this more like a public lecture. So I will not take you to mm -hmm. the mathematics of this. So the reference is giving, uh, link is there. So you can, if you are interested, you can look at this, this paper. So basically we, we try to find the distribution of the wind. That's all. And then we build a model for prediction purpose. So, so we developed a new statistical approach to wind prediction, speed and direction, both, and tested in the data from the Energy Resource Research Laboratory, Wind Data Archive from Oregon State University. So it is a close to a place, it's called Walla Walla. So I just to, to say why it's appearing twice. So this is a native language word. So they don't have a plural over there. So they, they say twice, walla walla. There is a St. Charles University in, in Australia. I visited some time ago. It's in Wagga Wagga. So when I say, what's Wagga? So Wagga is crow. Then the more than one crow used to come there. So they call the city name is Wagga Wagga. So if you see something like that, this must be coming from indigenous word. So, and actually there's a university of Walla Walla in, in Oregon also, if you Google it. So now it's so easy to Google it. So anyway. So it's just the side business. So to enhance the ability to predict wind behavior, we propose this bootstrap methods. It's, it's, it's a very well-known technique, bootstrapping in, in statistics. And it's a fully probabilistic model to forecast of the wind speed. So this new model was tested using wind speed and the direction collected from August 2003 to date. And this is some, some descriptive statistics, the box plot. 
So east wind and the west wind, there is always difference. And that's, we, we just reveal what is true. We don't invent anything, we just reveal what is true. So you can see there are many outliers also. So there's this, you find a threshold point, you have to also consider the outliers. Sometimes in, in data cleaning, people remove the outliers. That may cause a problem, depending on what kind of data you are getting. And this is another graph of the dynamics of hourly wind. Again, eastern and western wind. So we implied only rough wind data. We did not clean the data because sometimes cleaning can cause trouble. And did not pre-process with measurement by discarding or trimming any stretches of the data. So we work on the full data. So our proposed new methods produce very fine results, very good results. And giving its competitive performance, it has been referenced by many, many, in many papers, but I'm not sure how the, in commercial way, how many people applied people are using it or not. <clears throat> so model will help to ensure the future that includes clean and sustainable energy. So as I said, you know, as a statistician, so can talk about sustainable, I say, what can I do? I, I, nothing to do, but yes, we can do something. So I was able to, to build a model and analyze the data. So I will stop here. The world is in our hands. So again, basic science is important. Yeah, just the... You see, uh, since this is a very important topic, uh, in many of the developing countries, we have this enduring debate of basic versus applied sciences. And uh, very often policy makers have a very little understanding of how scientific endeavors progress. They insist on applied sciences. And they keep insisting to a level that become obsession. They want from million rupees project of product development. How would you counter that? So what's the main so question? It, the you know, insistence on applied sciences oh, okay, and not okay. giving attention yeah, to basic yeah. sciences to the level of obsession yeah, yeah. So the, 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 I understand the problem is the, the business people, they are looking for a quick solution. So they say somebody in applied sciences can, can provide a solution. So they, they go, go after that person and they forget the basic science. So, so I think uh, the problem is, is, is the basic scientists. We have to take that message out. A person to become applied needs to have some tools and tools are given by the basic, basic sciences. If the basic sciences are dry up, if the knowledge dry up, then nothing should go for the application. So I think in some way we are responsible. We should be blame ourselves that we are not taking our message to community and to maybe show that kind of a complex art system. They say, oh, it's too complex. I don't want to bother. Just forget about it. So we have to come with a simple and, and, and reasonable solution and make sure that they understand that the, the, all these applied scientists or engineers or technologists, they are doing it because there is a, some funda mathematical and fundamental things from physics, chemistry, biology, you name it, is available there. So we are still using that pool of the knowledge. So we have to increase that pool of knowledge for the future challenges, because whatever knowledge we have, so that's the... So for sustainability of science, right? not alone sustainability of the world, but sustainability of science, basic science is important. Yeah, yeah that's, no, I mean, the, if you have some basic things, you can build upon it. So, so I generally, I mean, then you, and sometimes our, our faculty members, professor, they go crazy because the students coming from some different area, and they, they are taking one and two course in either chemistry, biology, or math, they're not going to do PhD in, in biology and math. So we should teach them accordingly. And that's why sometimes the students, they get, they go away, they lose interest. So it is, it's a both side has to come to the, that point. So what kind of chemistry and biology we should be teaching? And we, these students are not going to do PhD in chemistry. So that's the a good balance is required uh, from the, from the scientist side also. But if you if you if I don't know two plus two is four, how I can move further? So we need to have a basic knowledge.
What happened? What did I do? It's okay. Oh. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Professor Nijaz, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, up next, I would like to invite Professor Ping Liang for his presentation on the relevance of DNA sequencing technologies and genomics for today and future. Please, sir. Good afternoon, or hello, everyone. Um, I know also people are uh, friends online. Um, I also want to thank the organizer for giving asked uh, this opportunity uh, to speak uh, in this uh, very pre prestigious uh, platform, which spread over multiple countries. Uh, I think this is my, and this is, for me, it's my first time. And yeah, it's, it's great to, to see everyone, especially young people, you young people in this audience. Um, yeah, I have to apologize that I made a last minute change to my title uh, after realizing this talk is for uh, a more general audience. So I thought instead of give, like spend all the time telling you the details of my research, uh, it might be more useful to give you an overview of the field that I'm in and then uh, throw out some uh, discussions. <clears throat> so yeah, so my title is the relevance of uh, DNA sequencing and genomics uh, for our today's research and life and also for our future. <clears throat> so in the last, last 30 minutes or so, I'd like to uh, just give you a quick overview of the status of the DNA sequencing technology and uh, yeah, also uh, talk about a few areas of uh, genomics and how can genomics impact our society and what are the opportunity and what are the challenges that we're facing. <clears throat> and I admire my boss, he just, he said that he put uh, the order randomly and then and it happens to be the right one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, let me first walk you through um, the history of genetics, which can be broken down into four major period, starting from the late uh, 17th century by our uh, founding father of genetics. Guess who? Yeah, Greg Mendel, right? And yeah, so for that period, it, we, the only thing we know is we have something called heredity, where we pass traits from father to son, mother to daughter, or, right? But we don't know what's going on behind, what's the principle. <clears throat> and the best thing that Morgan was able to do is to say the genetic factors on chromosome, right? something that can be seen under microscope. <clears throat> And then later on, in 19, around 1940s, we uh, discovered and confirmed that DNA is actually the genetic materials. But we, we are not able to uh, know the sequences. We have no way to find out the details, sequences of, of the DNA actually automatically moved. And uh, so that actually is the modern genetics area. So that's the classical genetics. So we only know uh, the relation, there is some relationship between phenotypes and, and reproductions. But we move on to uh, know that DNA is the basis of genetics. And guess what then we, uh, during this period, one critical development is the 
discovery of uh, double DNA double helix structure by Watson and Crick, right? <clears throat> so that model basically solved all the uh, basic question about how genetics works <clears throat> at the very fundamental level, not missing a lot of details. And then in the early 70s, uh, we, we started to have the Sanger sequencing technology or methodology, as we can only call it methodology. And we, we are able to know the details and how DNA works at the sequence level and then be able to link the sequence to proteins and to other things, right? <clears throat> so that's the molecular biology. You can see the period starts to become shorter and shorter. So here we have DNA-based and then we started to have sequence-based. And then I guess somewhere around 2001 and depending on who you are talking to, we are moving to a brand new era called the genome era. So we are all now in the genome era. <clears throat> and then within the genome area, uh, we in 2001, 2001, as most of you know, one of landmark discovery or achievement of human kind is the, uh, the, the publication of the human genome sequence, right? And which all the whole society was very excited about. Although some people actually end up being disappointed because we end up finding out the number of our gene, right? The smartest animal or organism on the world, it's pretty much the same as the fruit fry. So people are very <laughs> well, offended by the discovery, yeah. But that, that's how, that's the nature of biology and we still have a lot to learn. <clears throat> and right after that, we, uh, so we had the human genome sequence and the se genome sequence of many other organisms. So, uh, but if we just focus on person, like a human genetics and very soon after that, we are moving to a new area called personal genomics, which is something I'm going to talk a little bit more. And then if you look at the, uh, this is the number of genomes we have, personal genomes. So after that few years, quite a few years later, after the publication of the human genome reference sequence, we had two famous individuals. They are able to afford to have, they're famous enough. Uh, they can get people to have their genome sequenced. And guess who, who those people, two people are? It's, uh, it's James Watson and Craig Winter. Craig Winter was not because he was famous, but he was, I mean, he is a great scientist, but he also is a rich person and he, actually have access to the most powerful Sanger sequencing technology at that time. And then right after we have a group of 20 people got their genome sequenced. And then soon after we have the completion of the 1000 genome project, which is actually involves more than 2,500 people. And now this year we have the UK published their whole genome sequencing of more than 150,000 people. So you can see that very rapid increase at the scale of the uh, personal genomics. <clears throat> and all this rapid uh, involvement of the science, uh, especially in the, in the area of genomics, is attributed to the uh, rapid development of DNA sequencing technology. And I'd like to use this slides just to quickly give you some idea uh, how much we have, how much changes are, have happened in the last uh, less than 20 years, uh, two decades of time. <clears throat> so remember, I just mentioned to you in the early 70s, we have the Sanger sequencing. And then that sequencing methodology was the only method available until mid like 2005. <clears throat> but the technology, I mean, it's a science-driven technology. Again, it's a curiosity-driven 
uh, development. Uh, it changed, it, it happened so quickly. And with, with the effort of many companies, many scientists, actually a lot of those, actually behind each company, successful company, there's, there's one or more famous scientists behind as the founder of those companies. <clears throat> So now we have a term called next generation sequencing, which covers uh, at least two different generations now. So compared to the first generation of uh, Sanger sequencing, one critical fundamental difference is described in this word, in, in this phrase called massively parallel sequencing. So with the Sanger sequencing in the run, you can only run up to the best you can do is like 396 samples. However, with, with today's next generation sequencing, you can sequence hundreds of millions of DNA molecules simultaneously and very quickly. So that's really the, where the power is, thanks to the development of nanotechnology and computation, I mean, computer science. And with that, capacity increase, and it brings down the cost of the sequencing from one base pair per million, which means we spend more than $3 billion for uh, create, I mean, generating the first version of the human genome sequence in 15, 15 years. And now we can do the same thing in a day with no more than $1,000. Right, think about the changes. <clears throat> and in addition, just to give you some more details, I am sure many of you, I'm not sure how many of you are biologists here. Okay, great. Yeah, we have a good portion. I'm really happy. <laughs> right. So, Sanger sequencing reads, uh, is actually the, the gold stand even today, and it can reach on average about 700 base pair at very good accuracy. Uh, of course, it depends on how you do it, how you prepare your sample. But today's uh, best machine can provide up to 1 million base pair in a single read. And that, that read length is very important in many applications by having the read length, a long read length. <clears throat> Of course, the, those, those platforms, they still suffer uh, shortfalls like accuracies, but we, we can be hopeful those technology will be able to quickly improve themselves uh, in the next year or 10 years, the most. And uh, yeah, in terms of output, uh, a Sanger, the best machine of Sanger sequencing maybe uh, generate about 100 KB sequence data, but with the best machine, next gener generation sequence machine, we can generate over 300, uh, 360 billion base pairs, right? <clears throat> I don't even know how many times <laughs> you can do the calculation for me. And in terms of time, right, we spend more than 10 years to sequence one genome, but now we can sequence uh, yeah, the many genomes in a day. In addition to output DNA sequence, uh, some of the newer platform can also detect the DNA methylation <coughs> profiles, which is very useful for studying epigenetics. Because the same data set you get for the same sample, exactly the same sample, you get two different data sets which is very difficult to, and then it's very critical to be able to uh, interpret the, the biology behind. So that's the technology and it's, uh, it's amazing. It's, uh, yeah, it, no one, I have been in the field of biology for 20, 30, more than 30 years now, and I never dreamed something like that to happen. <clears throat> And uh, this just showing you the, the speed of the price drop of the sequencing uh, exceeded uh, the prediction of the Moore's law. 
quite a lot. So that's that's very really very really, really exciting. And I remember every year I go to the American Society of Human Genetics meeting, which is involves uh, five six thousand people. The most exciting part is to go to the industry exhibition of uh, next generation sequencing. And they there is bringing all their best technologies, <clears throat> and you get to talk to those people. So thanks to the rapid advancement of DNA sequence technology, now um, it brought uh, rapid advancement to our biological research. And in a specifically is the, yeah, this is just gives you uh, a limited, a partial list of areas of biology that, that can be benefit from the next generation sequencing technologies. So basically it touches upon most, most critical area of biology and including environmental science, sciences. And I will be in the next few, uh, yeah, rest of my talk, I will be focusing on these two items here. And microarray was the technology dominant the market for studying gene expression and a lot of detections, uh, diagnosis for, for two decades. And then it was uh, now completely replaced by uh, sequencing technologies. <clears throat> and with those, those uh, application of DNA sequencing technology, and it brought to us many new fields. And those are just some of the terms uh, that describes those exciting sub areas of biology, right? starting from genomics, which is a study of, of genomes, right? And then you can have, yeah, sequencing a genome of a new species, and then you get to know uh, everything about the yeah, genetics behind that species. And metagenomics is also very exciting, and I'll give you some example. And of personal genomics is really also uh, something that is going to change our uh, life uh, in the future. <clears throat> and so I'm sure many of you have already seen those terms. Those are terms that are, haven't been existed for too long, right? just in the last two decades or so. Uh, so those are brand new. In the, in the history of science, it's, it's very short, very young, uh, very new fields. <clears throat> and then as you can see, many of those, uh, the data analysis of, of those fields requires what um, Dr. E just, just mentioned, the uh, statistical uh, modeling. <clears throat> and also because of the dramatic, uh, drop of the sequencing cost, it uh, enabled many large scale genome sequencing projects. And I just give you here a partial list and uh, you probably know uh, a lot more than that. But I just wanna uh, highlight a few. Uh, this is the Human Genome Project. And the 1000 Genome Project is probably the first uh, international consortium project on um, large scale uh, genome sequencing. And so what it is uh, now, it started from the phase one back in uh, 2008. And uh, just a couple of years ago, they finished the last phase. Uh, it's actually called, uh, they or originally they planned just three phase, but they actually went one step further. So I called uh, uh, three, uh, phase three plus. And what they did is they, um, they sequenced not only the original 2,500 human individual, but they also added another 600. And they sequenced every genome at 30 times coverage uh, by the Illumina pair and uh, platform. Um, plus some of, the, uh, some of the samples are also sequenced by the non-read platforms. Mm. And that covers 26 different population from different parts of the world. And so it has a pretty good representation of the human 
human diversity. But I mean, it's not still not the ideal, but it's the best so far. And then we also have the personal genome project uh, started by George Church uh, at uh, MIT, and now it's expanded to many countries. And it's a volunteer participation uh, that also included Canada. So if you are interested and if you get you want to also get involved, you can also get your genome, donate your DNA and add your your genome to the research pool of, of genomes. <clears throat> and this is what I just mentioned. So the UK is very ambitious. They are trying to, in the next few years, they are trying to fit, basically sequence all their human, uh, human populations. <clears throat> and also there's also many other specialized uh, projects focusing on cancer, uh, focusing on diseases, and then here we have a large scale project both focus on uh, different uh, group of organisms. Right? So a lot of big projects are going on and they have generated way more data than what we can handle. And so now the question is really, what kind of questions can you come up? And so if you can come up with a great brilliant questions, you. You, you may not need to generate your own data. You can just use the data that is already out there and then make big discoveries. <clears throat> so uh, genomics can be applied to uh, many areas of our societies. And that reminds me about uh, sustainability, which is the theme of this symposium. And let me just give you some examples. Uh, by knowing, uh, by sequencing all the organisms on Earth, we will be able to identify organisms that has the ability, the best efficiency to produce hydrogen right, to solve our energy problems. Or a superbar that is able to break down all the waste and that solves our contamination problems or another crop that, that is so effective and the, with the yield, so that solves our food problem. I mean, so it's not gonna probably solve the problem completely, but at least genomics is gonna be a very powerful uh, tool, uh, approach to uh, really address the sustain sustainability issues. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, let me just give you, uh, use this as a one example, uh, how genomics can speed up uh, discovery or address these issues uh, that we face in, as a society. I like to make a dis disclaim here. I'm not in a position to judge anything about the origin or the <laughs> problem with the SAR the COVID-19, but I want to just use the comparison or use this as example to <laughs> demonstrate to you, like in this case is the metagenomics approach, how powerful it is uh, to address the issues. So if probably a lot of you may not remember the 2003 SARS, but I, I remember because one of the meeting, that big meeting, the American Society of Genetics meeting, was originally scheduled to happen in Toronto, but because of the SARS, it was canceled and later put uh, uh, moved to Washington DC. <clears throat> so from the first uh, report to the uh, release of the genome sequence, it took about six months. And that's still pretty impressive because we already have the best of the Sanger sequencing technology. Right. But now, uh, 20 years later, we have a similar situation. And it only took uh, actually less than two months from the first report to the publication of the genome sequences. And by using this approach that it was not available <laughs> at that time. And that saved us four months, which is going to be can, which can make a huge difference, right? In terms of uh, 
the control of the of the disease diseases by being able to develop uh, the vaccines very quickly. All right, so let's move on to the application of genomics and just, uh, addressing genetic diseases. And this just gives you a quick overview of uh, the speed of the uh, gene discoveries. <clears throat> so between uh, 2005, 2009, on average, uh, it's about 170 discoveries. And then it increases up to 240 per year. And now, uh, right, the, app the application of like next generation sequence and really uh, made a huge contribution, speed up the process of these gene discoveries. But we still have a lot of work to do. So at least 6,000 gene conditions are, not, are still unknown. And uh, people have predicted by 2025 with the application of the best next generation sequence technology, we'll be able to sequence at least six, 60 million patients. And that's a huge data pool for us to uh, look into and then make all discovery, all kinds of discoveries. And another uh, big challenge is, uh, is the complex diseases. It's much harder to, uh, to figure out the exact uh, causes of the gene, of the disease. And also uh, most of the discovery here are about protein-coding gene, which is a little easier than the non-coding genes. And so we, we don't even have exact number of lung coding gene in our genomes because they are so diverse. Uh, there's less of evidence to help us to identify. Okay, so again, this is another figure just to show you uh, the, the, yeah, the change of the paradigms in gene discovery. So you can see that the next generation sequencing te technology is quickly taking over the conventional uh, methodology for gene discovery. And I, you can see that it's also showing an upper chain. And I, I can expect, we can expect that line is going to be keep going up. <clears throat> All right, just let me uh, spend a few more minutes talking about personalized medicine. And so uh, the definition of personalized medicine is a medical method that targets treatment structure and medicinal decision based on patients' predicted response uh, or risk of disease. And the basis for prediction is our genome. So with the cost going down further and further, we will be able to afford to do a whole genome sequencing for everyone on the earth, even before they were born, right? And that's the, that's the basic idea. So once we have the genome, we know we can apply all kinds of sophisticated prediction models, right? Which uh, Dr. E. just was talking about. And uh, yeah, we can predict what's gonna happen. Uh, and then we can take preventive uh, procedures to pre prevent problem from happening instead of when the problem happens, we deal with it, right? That, that's one major benefit of it. <clears throat> but also like in terms of the drug, the treatment. And I'm not sure if you know, if the sad news here is today is among the drugs we're using, there's no more than 50% that works. So basically we are wasting 50% of our money for drugs that don't, don't work for us, not alone the side effects, right? So with the, with the uh, uh, personalized medicine or pre precision medicine, we know what drugs will work for us, all, all conditions. So when we use that treatment, it's gonna work. So that's, that's really the big promise of uh, precision medicine or personalized medicines. <clears throat> so that will, we can, yeah, we can be very hopeful that the future medicine 
based built on the personal genomics, it will be able to save us, save lives, save cost, and improve the quality of life. <clears throat> and that also, uh, I guess, partially addresses the susten sustainability issues. <clears throat> And this is just to another uh, one of the figures uh, in the public domain talks about the differences, overlaps uh, of those different terms <clears throat> that you may run into. <clears throat> okay, so just a little bit about what we do in terms of genomics at Brock. Um, so one of the major research area that my lab focus on is the uh, characterization of genomic variants among humans that are derived from DNA transpositions. Uh, I'm not sure if you know, if you guys know about transposable elements. It's actually a major component of our genome. As much as about 50% of genomes are transposable elements. And many of those elements are still actively doing their, their transition. So if you look at any uh, unrelated individual, even in this audience, we are talking about on average uh, three to 4,000 different insertion in our genome. And those insertions does all kinds of things to, to the gene functions. So they are part of the genetic variants that contribute to our phenotypic differences. We also sequence the genome of lavender mm -hmm and also uh, a, a few of the carpenter bees. <clears throat> and we also had a, a paper uh, reported their genetic mutation that are responsible for their congenital cataract and zone spheres uh, through a publication with uh, my collaborator in China. And we also working on a new uh, grapevine genetic testing. <clears throat> and one of the major hurdles um, with the use of whole genome sequence data is uh, the data is actually stored as a raw sequence format, which makes it very difficult to use. So in order to be able to uh, really fully benefit from those sequence data, we need a method or algorithm to convert those very highly redundant fragmented data of genome data into phased deployed genome sequence data. And I, we are actually also working on the algorithm for doing that. All right, so that's basically summarized uh, what we are currently working on. And I just wanna uh, leave you uh, a, a few messages here. Um, yeah, so moving forward, I mean, the sequence cost is still high for what we want to achieve, but we can be hopeful that it will be quickly reaching to a point that is uh, affordable. <clears throat> and uh, currently, we are still lack we are still lacking efficient algorithm for the, for the problem that I, I was just describing to you. And our knowledge about the relationship between genetics and the disease or phenotype in general is still very limited. So we have a lot of work to do. And yeah, and then also we, we don't have, to, at this point, the tools are mostly for research and very fragmented. In order for the, uh, for the uh, society to be able to benefit it, we, we wanna make sure that the doctors and other many other professionals, they are able to use the knowledge to, to benefit their patients <clears throat> or their customers. And we have very little mechanism in place, in place to facilitate the data sharing or exchange. So uh, yeah, so in summary, uh, genomics is really revolutionized our bio, bio, mm -hmm. biomedical research and it's also going to bring dramatic changes to our uh, societies. <clears throat> Genomics is the foundation of precision medicines or personalized medicines. And we need, in order for those things to happen, we need to be able to provide 
uh, national and even international infrastructures to for the storage exchange and analysis of those data. <clears throat> and we also need proper uh, regulations uh, for making sure the data is it's properly, safely, and efficiently used. And we also need to train more people like you guys and to, to have the uh, skill set, knowledges, and not only biologists, but also engineers, computer scientists, statisticians, right, to, to work together to get the full benefit. So I really, I would like to invite you guys to really contribute to the, this exciting field uh, by, by, by delaying your passions, by delaying your uh, uh, intelligence and wisdoms to make this happen for our human society. And that's, that's, my, uh, yeah, that, that's what I have for you today. Thank you for listening. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Shisha, uh, what's your last sheet of? What's wrong? What should you think? What should you think? Wow. Take a look. What's that? 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 What's that how can we reduce antimicrobial resistance using this personalized medicine technique? How can you reduce produce antimicrobial anti resistance? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So <clears throat> I guess that yeah, the, the anti uh, resistance uh, is also, I mean, it's just the nature of the biology, right? Um, but by applying genomics, uh, you, you can see exactly what happened in those uh, bacterial or, I mean, it's bacterial. Uh, and then you can, you can I guess, if you kind of figure out uh, the, 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 the patterns of the evolution. Uh, and then there, there's also like we, uh, in actually, um, in, in, what I actually have, uh, I mean, the uh, graduate student that actually I, I was uh, on committee for, they are also, uh, they are actually doing, using the fudge uh, to, uh, as a way of uh, treating the bacteria because fudge can uh, eat bacteria, I mean, uh, or, yeah. Uh, so there, there are many ways to deal with it. And certainly it's not a simple question, uh, not an easy task to do because we are constantly fighting with <laughs> another side right it's a uh, it's a battle that we are we are we are facing all the time but yeah being able to apply the newer tech newest technology it does give us the weapon to fight uh, to do our fight with yeah uh, sir, just a question on your personalized medicine i think it's a great way forward that if we can predict what diseases we are more prone to. But just a question I have is what happens to the privacy of that data? Because if we have that as a large, a very large scale, and we already know what a person is prone to, um, yeah. and if that data is available out in the open, won't it create kind of a discrimination which might affect your chances of getting a job, life insurance, medical insurance? So how do we continue to move in that field and get the positives while trying to reduce these negatives? That's a great question. And that's an issue people have concern about. And that's where also the resistance uh, from the uh, parts of the community comes from. And so that really has to be addressed by policies, uh, by regulation, uh, government regulations. So the data, uh, like, yeah, like if my child has their sequence, genome sequenced, I, I, I want to be able to control who have the access to the data. And that, that rights has to be really controlled by the owner of the, of the genome. Uh, and that's not easy to do. Um, 
right? Because on one side, you want to facilitate uh, the exchange of the knowledge, but on the other hand, right, uh, you have those issues, you have those um, legitimate concerns that, I mean, deserve to be protected. So that, that can be only addressed by, by uh, regulations, I, I think. But I, I hope that we as a society, we will be able to reach a consensus, what will be the best way to move forward. Yeah, thank you for your questions. Any other questions? Thank you so much, Professor Yang. Um, okay, so our next lecture is going to be by Professor Georgi Nikonov, and the title um, for his presentation is On the Way to Sustainable Catalysis from Transition Metals to Main Group Elements. What do you say? Okay, thank you. Uh, just of all, I would like to thank Professor Chadri and his uh, team was uh, here and encourage you for really warm hospitality. I should say I, I came to Pakistan for the first time. I discovered this beautiful country and I re I'm really enjoying staying here. And thank you all for, your, for the treatment you gave to us. Um, well, we had a biologist just speaking before me and obviously he persuaded you how important biology is. And, <laughs> oh, I didn't put biology before chemistry, which I will remember for a while. So I will speak for chemistry and uh, chemistry is actually extremely important. So how important? Uh, you possibly don't appreciate that in the Western world or let's generally more speaking in more industrialized countries, chemistry contributes to about 25% of GDP. So like, I don't have a dollar in my, in my pocket. We, we, we have this loony coin, but like quarter of that coin is actually thanks to chemistry from all, you know, it transpires in all areas in society. So agriculture, medicine, clothes we wear, perfume we, we put on a lot, right? Uh, it's really, really big deal. But chemistry in terms of sustainability is, um, in many eyes is a big problem. So that slide, the kind of pinky slide, the defining slide that it just put, uh, that was likely some kind of chemical plant, right? We are polluting. Yes, we do. Unfortunately, we, we need to sustain uh, 8, mil, uh, 8 billion people on the earth. We need to produce all these materials which we consume and chemistry plays a huge role in doing that. But we also pollute, right? So it's a, it's a big problem. Uh, or it is its perception, but chemistry is also a solution to the problem. And I just give you an example. Uh, before SARS um, COVID pandemics, uh, one of the biggest fears was that uh, uh, birds flu would, uh, birds flu pandemic would evolve, right? And the drug uh, against, we, we do have drug against birds flu, uh, but you possibly don't know that this drug uh, is solely relies on the natural product, which has really, really short supply. For kind of birds flu epidemics, which we had, it was enough. But for pandemic, it wasn't. And actually, chemistry broke, led by my colleague, late Professor Tomasz Pliki, found a shortcut to making this drug, this exact drug, by much more efficient way. And the source for that was actually coal. Coal is cheap. Right? So we did have solution to the problem, even before the problem, um, happen and thanks God it didn't happen. Unfortunately, we, we did have another problem and we solution came, but uh, uh, much later. And this is where biologists actually played a big role. But in that example, you can see chemistry was solution. Uh, and uh, um, there are some other examples when, uh, when they are. So uh, the title here is On the Way to Sustainable Catalysis. And I, uh, I should say that this talk is actually one hour long, not half an hour, and it's tailored <laughs> for chemists. 
so there was a bit of miscommunication what kind of uh, presentation I should uh, I should give and I understand most of you are not even chemists. So I'll try to be less technical as possible, more general as possible. Still, there will be some chemistry, there will be formulas. Uh, uh, I'll try to make it easier and I will have to cut a lot of slides. So I will just browse through the slides and tell you just part of the story. So what is catalysis? Catalysis is a, one of the major chemical processes where you have a reaction and the reaction may not be ideal. It either doesn't go where you want, it doesn't give you a product which you want, produce a lot of waste. And then you add the magic material, usually in small amount, which make this reaction happen. Or they make this reaction more efficient. You uh, go to lower temperatures, you go to higher production of the chemical which you need, less waste and in the fact um, catalysis is one of the major uh, processes in chemistry so uh, in this uh, in this talk i want to show you how to make uh, well just in, in some examples from my group how to make it even more efficient so uh, a bit of catalysis about 85 of chemical processes uh, they have catalysis at least in one step Right, and as I said, the chemistry is persuasive, it's everywhere. Uh, the success in catalysis over the last, I would say, 50 years has been tremendous. What we can do now, we couldn't even imagine uh, 50 years ago. There are still problems, and one of the biggest problems is selectivity. Chemist selectivity, regional selectivity, stereo selectivity. So uh, I understand many of you don't know the meaning of the terms. The idea is very simple. Can we make it more efficient, more sustainable? Can we minimize the waste and all this awful smoke that you could see in uh, Professor Arnett's uh, talk, right? Make, basically be more efficient, more sustainable. Another one, uh, a lot of uh, current catalysts which rely heavily on transition metals, they have this problem. So the metals themselves are toxic. They are quite expensive. We have a supply problem, the abundance of some materials, like a lot of um, typical catalysts based on rhodium, uh, palladium. Obviously, these metals uh, are very expensive and rather rare, right? So supply chains, that's, that's a big deal, right? Now, uh, there are, as I said, the progress has been quite remarkable, but there are some reactions which are difficult to do. So uh, cleavage of some very strong bonds or making some strong bonds, uh, we still need to learn how to do it and do it uh, more effectively. General efficiency, conditions like temperature. A lot of reactions are done at very high temperature. We, 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 we need to spend fuel that will produce CO2 and all the consequences associated with that. So these are just some of the problems which we still have and we have to solve, right? Now, in terms of uh, types of catalysis, industrial catalysis is still pretty much heterogeneous. This is where most of the value is actually produced. And most of this is actually making rather simple chemicals, which we still use in huge amount, like sulfuric acid or nitric acid. Nitric acid, production of nitric acid, to the fixation of uh, nitrogen making ammonia nitric acid, that's one of the biggest chemical processes. These are relatively simple chemicals produced on huge scale, right? Um, then homogeneous catalysis, that's uh, when you have your catalyst dissolve in, in, in the media. And in this case, we can do miracles. We can make really high value added products, very expensive products, those which were actually used in drugs or we, we used in cosmetics and, and, and this kind of uh, things. Uh, there are <clears throat> uh, a lot of opportunities for us to do it in a tailored way. We, we can do it very effectively. That's about 17% of chemicals, less in volume, maybe more uh, in, uh, in the revenue generated. And biocatalysis. Okay, so I'm actually, uh, my, my research is here in, in homogeneous catalysis, where we know exactly what we do, or at least we fool ourselves that we know exactly what we do, and we try to do it in a more controlled way. So uh, just to show you a few stories uh, from my group, where we try to do things better. And that's possibly the take home message for you, that uh, there are uh, always solutions to problems. So we, um, I just would like to echo uh, uh, Professor uh, Chadri uh, in what he said that the importance of basic knowledge, because all these practical applications, which I'm going to show you, they actually came from very fundamental basic research. 
And when I was doing the basic research, I, I had no idea, no expectation that it would result in something practical, right, and solve any problems. I was uh, basically uh, uh, fulfilling my curiosity. It was curiosity-driven research, exactly what you said. And it happened that the barrier to application is actually not, not that big. You can always take your discovery and make it practical. Right. So uh, at some point we arrived at this complex. Uh, again, this was derivative of our very basic research. Uh, the uh, initial work was done on compound, which would look very, very fancy. And uh, I would need to spend a lot of time to uh, how to explain. We actually reduce it to this one. This is relatively simple uh, organometallic compound. It has transition metals, some simple ligands. And uh, pretty much any trained chemist can make it, inorganic chemist can make it. It's not a big deal. So some very similar compounds are commercially available and this one can actually be produced uh, in one step from commercially available uh, compound. But what transpired from our research that we can make some uh, transformations which from chemical perspective are very, very difficult to do and we could do them effectively. Like if you take this compound with a bond uh, between carbon and nitrogen, it's triple bond, it's called nitrile. I just explained to some of you who are not uh, chemists or biologists. Uh, and it's one of the uh, basic chemicals, important class of compounds belongs to the type of carbonyl compounds. And it is one of the least reactive in carbonyl family, right? So what actually happens in this reaction, we add silane, uh, which is available from commercial processes. And we can convert this least reactive uh, chemical nitrile in a way more reactive chemical imine. So this is more reactive, but reaction stops here, right? We do this addition only once. And usually this addition happens twice. So we found conditions when we can take the least reactive, make more reactive. And this one is just one step away from aldehyde, which is a building block for organic chemistry. You can make a lot of chemicals from aldehydes, right? So uh, usually that doesn't happen, we made it happen. So this, this was published in Angevanta uh, at some point. And then we uh, extended this research to another interesting case when we took pyridine and we could, uh, or pyridine, subject pyridines, we could add silane to pyridine in such a way that we produce a class of dihydropyridines with silicon here and hydrogen going here. And it is one for isomer. And uh, what I didn't know when I was doing this, uh, we actually discovered very selective production of a class of compound, which otherwise was a um, uh, really big problem in science because usually it wasn't selective. We always had a mixture of one, two, and one, four, and it would require several steps, a lot of chemicals uh, being used. Uh, we could do it in very high yield. Essentially, it was qualitative reaction and just making one out of two possible, no waste product produced. So no waste here, no waste here. High yields, essentially uh, uh, quantitative yields, right? So this is all was enabled by, uh, by using this, uh, this catalyst. So we uh, extended this reaction to some other classes. This was uh, production uh, of uh, aldehyde. Uh, out of um, um, uh, acid chloride. So this was semi-catalytic in sense. Um, but still, we could selectively, uh, selectively reduce uh, uh, this. Uh, um, um, sele we could selectively reduce uh, acids into aldehyde semi-catalytically because we could produce uh, acid chloride out of acid and then qualitatively produce aldehyde and reaction just stops here. So, and uh, uh, if you take um, uh, uh, amide. Again, in two steps, you could produce um, uh, chloramine and then uh, that, that could be reduced to, e, uh, to emine. So again, very, very selective second step enabled by, the, uh, by, by this catalyst. So um, uh, again, I, I'll drop this stuff. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that's how we do chemistry. We try to understand how it works. We do some um, um, kinetic studies and uh, basically we try to learn how the catalyst works. Once we know how it works, we can develop the catalyst even further, right? So uh, this was done by, uh, uh, the, the previous work was done by Dmitry Gutzeliak, and this was done by uh, Samali. Uh, right, so uh, she did some further, and this is my second step. So uh, in the previous example, which worked very well for us, 
We use silate. You notice that. And I said it's an accessible compound, but still, it's relatively expensive compound. And even more important, when you process these chemicals and you produce uh, final chemicals, which you would use, uh, it generates some waste. So it would produce siloxane, as chemists would appreciate, right? Can, can we do it even more effectively? Can we go away from that? Well, so um, I invite you to take some lessons from nature. And uh, how does nature does? Nature actually amazingly does a lot of things more effectively than we can do. And some of those things are done by rather primitive uh, uh, organisms like bacteria. Uh, I believe chemists know that bacteria can fix more nitrogen from, uh, from air and basically feed all the plants than we produce artificially. Bacteria is more effective, right? And does it everywhere on us, almost everywhere on us. So uh, some chemistry done in natural world is also extremely effective. And uh, here we go to uh, the world of enzymes, naturally occurring catalyst. So uh, for example, this enzyme, uh, which looks like this, it would do uh, reduction in oxidation chemistry. And in the, uh, um, um, uh, in, 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 in this world, what it does by taking hydrogen from somewhere or transferring hydrogen somewhere, hydrogen equivalent, right? It's not the hydrogen which is which moves, it's some kind of a complex molecule which can be uh, look rather complex like here, but all it does, it basically transfers the equivalent of hydrogen. So this is called transfer hydrogenation. And obviously we can use molecules like this, they are uh, would be quite expensive and an effective process to do. But the idea is that you can take a chemical containing hydrogen, uh, apply a catalyst, transfer hydrogen to whatever you want, and ideally produce some kind of waste which would be more benign, right? So that's the idea of uh, transfer hydrogenation. And um, there are challenges in transfer hydrogenation. So we can do it pretty much well for uh, some simple uh, and more reactive chemicals like uh, ketones and aldehyde. But for some other substrates uh, from the same family or different family, like nitriles, which I mentioned, heterocycles, esters, amides, uh, emides, some aromatic compounds, it's much less developed area. So this is where we wanted to contribute. And uh, we took our original catalyst, which worked very well for us. Now we developed some related catalysts, they're shown here. And we started transfer hydrogenation product, uh, project, uh, which, uh, where we used uh, uh, alcohol as a hydrogen source. So alcohols are obviously much cheaper than the uh, natural equivalent product like an ADH. And uh, when you transfer hydrogen, let's say from isopropanol, which is one of the most common chemicals in transfer hydrogenation business, the product would be acetone, right? So that's relatively simple molecule. It doesn't produce so much waste. So we applied our catalyst, it actually got well. So uh, uh, these are the runs again. I'm not going through this uh, table because I understand for non chemists it will not be so much interesting, but at least we show that we can use alcohol in our catalyst and do this reduction chemistry. The efficiency of that is less than what we had with silane, but at least it was the uh, right, um, uh, right first step. So I'll uh, skip this uh, Esther story and just, again, we, 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 we do studies, we, we do kinetic analysis, we deduce um, uh, rate loss for reactions that allows us to speculate about mechanisms, how this reaction actually goes. So uh, again, I, I'll, I'll skip this uh, uh, technical details. So uh, just a few words about this uh, subfield and transfer of origination of nitriles. Uh, I'm sort of obsessed with nitriles. Uh, we started doing that, we succeeded. And uh, throughout my career, I, 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 I keep coming back to nitriles and do some chemistry of nitriles. So um, in uh, transfer hydrogenation business, uh, there was this uh, full reduction of nitriles when you transfer two hydrogen equivalents from um, some simple alcohols, such as butanol and propanol. They are short length alcohols. Um, relatively cheap or from formates, like uh, uh, this is formic acid and ammonia, uh, which is quite expensive, but produces carbon dioxide as the only uh, product generally. And you can see in these examples, you have reductions of uh, nitriles, which cause uh, like full reduction, not selective. Uh, sometimes you also have alkylation and uh, the part 
that derives from alcohol to propanol in this case is shown in blue. Sometimes you have further reactions, like uh, in this case, it's a coupling of the product with um, uh, formic acid. So this is where we found the field. Um, so uh, another, another um, um, uh, field of interest for us was a reduction of um, heterocycles. Like in this case, uh, you can see people um, try to convert um, NAD to NADH uh, by using ethanol, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that this compound could be used as an actual reagent and make it as a cycle, or use alcohol directly for transferring to um, uh, heterocycles and producing uh, value added products. So, uh, got by quite a few people. So, uh, uh, Sangwa, uh, who also did a bit of research in the previous project, she looked at that. And again, by using our major catalyst, a catalyst actually uh, shown here, and we found that we can reduce um, nitrile. It's a full reduction of nitrile by 2-propanol. But in this case, you also have a subsequent coupling of the product acetone with amine to produce these amines. And uh, it's, a, it's a good reaction because uh, after this, you can make uh, even more products based on these amines. So um, I'll, I'll possibly skip uh, this first derivatization uh, of the catalyst done by, by Mai. He was a very good student in my group and worked a lot. This is actually better catalyst, but um, uh, it does pretty much the same, the same job. And uh, he was the first one who could uh, apply it for reduction of heterocycles. And we, we had reduction of heterocycles by transfer perigenation as well. So you can see we, we have this major catalyst. We have this magic reaction with silane. We now try to make it more sustainable by using a reagent uh, that is cheaper and produces less waste uh, down the road at the end of the reaction, right? We are not exactly there. So the efficiency of reactions is not as good as what we had with silane. But that's the logic uh, that we are following here. So, <clears throat> uh, uh, yeah, so just keep this uh, mice work. Um, so, all the studies. Uh, so, uh, this another resilient catalyst, it was done by uh, Irina Alshakova, another, another PhD student in my uh, group. Again, uh, how we made this catalyst, the logic behind made, uh, making this catalyst, I'll skip because it's, um, it's rather technical, just applications um, uh, of this catalyst. So again, we, we, we take uh, nitrile, we take two propanol, and uh, the same, uh, this catalyst will do the same chemistry, uh, maybe a bit more effectively. So we have reduction, subsequent coupling, production, uh, production of this emians. Uh, and if you're just interested in emian derived from, uh, from uh, acetone, uh, that's the only product. There is no waste, right? So if you want to have amine, then you hydrolyze, you produce acetone as a waste, which you just cut and use uh, amine in your applications. So uh, she also used it for heterocycles. And you can see we could reduce variety of heterocycles uh, in um, nitrogen containing heterocycles uh, 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 from pyridine family, also some um, uh, other heterocycles containing oxygen and sulfur. Um, and uh, a bit of reduction of ester. So, ester is a really big problem. Um, uh, there is no good transfer perigenation project for ester. We only could do it uh, rather poorly, uh, but as a first step, it's actually important when we put accepting group here, we could have some, uh, uh, some reduction, uh, but not generally and uh, substrate scope is, uh, is rather poor, unfortunately. So uh, now the alcohols which are used here is uh, to, uh, to propanol. Again, it's accessible, it's relatively cheap, it produces acetone as a waste, which is not that harmful waste, but can we do it even better? And uh, solution to that is uh, to use more benign mm -hmm. reducing reagent which is ethanol. It's one uh, carbon less, right? But ethanol is actually produced from natural sources. And there is huge production of ethanol now, not for uh, making uh, uh, beverages uh, or application in, um, um, uh, in medicinal application, but also as a fuel, right? We burn a lot of ethanol because it's produced from green mass, from uh, um, basically growth and fields. So if you use ethanol, uh, that's uh, 
you can call green chemical, right? Because it it it, it comes from uh, from natural sources. It's reproducible. You don't you don't burn carbon or other uh, fossil fuels to produce this chemical. And in this case, we could uh, do this reaction even more interestingly because in addition to reduction, which happens here, we also have alkylation. So we have more value-added products produced in one go, and there is no waste. And we use alcohol, uh, green chemical, if you wish, uh, as a source of, uh, uh, as a base of this chemistry. Okay, so um, some other projects um, uh, like alkylation of uh, amines. Um, yeah, th th there was interesting reaction, but I, I'll, I'll possibly skip it here. So what I want to do now, just how much time do I have? Uh, <laughs> we, because I, five minutes. five minutes left. Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll give you a message. So you see, all this done with transition metals, right? And I believe I, I showed you the logic behind this research, how we, how we try to make it more effective by playing with um, uh, conditions, by playing with the uh, catalysts, by playing with uh, reagents, but with, they all rely on transition metals. And transition metals, they, there is cost and toxicity. So what we try to do now, and a lot of people in the world to, to do now, and I believe this is the way to go, is to go away from transition metals to main group elements. And main group elements, uh, they have different pro uh, properties. They haven't been traditionally considered to be as uh, good for catalysis. And in fact, uh, they can do catalysis. So in particular, if you look at zinc, and zinc is a post-transition metal, so uh, uh, it's, it's very benign metal. It's inexpensive, earth abundant, has low toxicity. And in fact, uh, zinc is part, acting part of uh, over 300 enzymes. And enzymes are naturally occurring catalysts. So a lot of, like inside your body now, there is a lot of chemistry being done by zinc. Right, you possibly don't appreciate that, but it's working. You see it, you breathe, right? You listen to me, and it's working in your body. So it's a it's a it's a good metal for catalysis from, from any perspective. So what we try to do at this point, we try to reproduce our chemistry down with ruthenium, with alcohol or silane, with zinc. And very quickly, pretty much in flash uh, uh, mode, I'll show you how it works. So uh, we first tested uh, again with silanes because silanes was first uh, uh, reagent which we used with uh, zinc. The, this is zinc hydride uh, on carbonyls. It worked quite well. But we, even with nitriles, we could reproduce our magic uh, reaction when, um, when we could add just one silane to this triple bond and reaction stops. Right? It wasn't as good as ruthenium, but as a proof of principle that uh, main group elements uh, can do the same chemistry, that was actually quite important. So uh, yeah, I'm skipping all these uh, technical details. So the mechanism actually um, uh, was uh, very interesting how it all happens. So uh, if any chemist in the audience, if there is any chemist in the audience interested, I can send you publications about that. So just uh, another example that not just nitriles, but the same catalyst can do pretty much similar work uh, with heterocycles. We can reduce heterocycles in the same way as ruthenium does, uh, although selectivity drops, right? Uh, but again, as a proof of principle that uh, post-transition metal, benign metal can do this chemistry, which few decades ago was unthinkable, um, uh, it works quite well. So um, I, I think I stop here. Uh, just uh, uh, another metal we looked at was uh, aluminum. And uh, uh, I just go to, because I ran out of time, as I just uh, try to hint, uh, I'll go to some conclusions. So with uh, homogeneous catalysis, when you know exactly what you're doing, particularly if you do physical chemical studies, you study mechanisms, and you can advance your catalysis even better if you know what you're doing, you can do magic. And there is so much left to do. So so message for you is there is a really bright future. The opportunities are there. You need to be brave. You need to go, you need to think of, uh, beyond boundaries, right? And uh, I possibly indicated some problems for you. You see, I, I'm trying to do that. I showed you the logic of this research, but I'm not saying that I solved all problems. So I'm trying to do it better. There are other problems to solve. Like for example, can I do transfer origination with main group elements using ethanol, benign, uh, benign chemical as a reagent? No, I cannot. It's my dream reaction. I want to do it. Once I do that, I possibly retire. 
So uh, anyways, uh, I need to thank my uh, uh, group uh, contributed to this. These are old uh, people. They are now all gone and have industrial jobs mostly of them. Uh, Kyla, who was uh, in aluminum project, was absolutely excellent student, but she didn't want to continue in academia. She actually went to be high school teacher. And I think it's a very good contribution to society as well, because you need to train people, very good people mm -hmm. who would translate this uh, uh, knowledge and uh, transfer to other people. So most of all the students they actually have industrial jobs. And finally, I would like to thank the agencies for uh, giving us money. So um, American Chemical Society administered uh, Petroleum Research Fund uh, was very generous in supporting this research. Uh, CFI uh, gave money for equipment. NCR has been very generous and I believe, or I hope they will continue to be generous because I'm now applying for renewal. And in the previous run, they gave me a uh, acceleration award, which was extremely helpful. And uh, yeah, I, I'm uh, on board of this journal. So I always put the slide up and encourage people from inorganic and bioorganic field to submit to Belton transactions, Royal Society Journal. Thank you. But I don't know who, who is in charge. Any questions? Boss is back. <coughs> yes, please. So what is the effect of the main group NMS on continuing catalyst as compared to the transition method catalyst on the stereo industry and reduce the catalyst? Well, um, the biggest benefit would be if you use benign main group elements such as zinc, aluminum. Um, uh, magnesium, calcium, they, they are benign, they're not toxic and they are not expensive, right? So in terms of selectivity, it's how you make your catalyst. It's, it's your curiosity, your imagination. So uh, currently transition metals uh, are the main players. So we, we know a lot about transition metals. There are industrial, like most industrial processes, they are based on transition metals uh, and they do very fancy chemistry. But what I want to show you that you can do pretty much the same fancy chemistry with main group elements and opportunities there are just enormous because it's uh, uh, the field hasn't been developed. It's being developed now. I know if that answers your question. Yeah, benefits are in the cost and less toxicity. If you have less, uh, less toxic catalyst, it means purification of your material is cheaper, right? And you don't spend so much um, um, money on making drugs because a lot of cost in making drugs is purification. You need to remove all this nasty transition metals out of out of mixtures. I believe more biologists in the audience than chemists. <laughs> that can do the same. <laughs> I <laughs> Hello, Dr. Imami. I hope you're well. Hi, Salam. I'm well. Thank you so much. Um, you can uh, try sharing your screen. Go ahead and share my screen. Can you see us also? Uh, yes, I can see you, Professor. How are you guys? I'm good. How are you doing? Good, good. good. It's uh, five o'clock for you or? Six, six, uh, uh, 6.40. So it's, I'm actually an early bird. So this is a good time for me. <laughs> okay, uh, my screen is right here. Yes. All right, so our next speaker um, is Professor Ali Amani. And his talk title will be Generalizable, Ethical, Interpretable, Natural Language Processing, Harmonizing Human Life and Humane. Um, over to you, Professor Imami, for your presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for having me. I want to thank Comstech and all of the professors also from Brock for making it while I couldn't make it. And for all of you attending, thank you so much for attending. And hopefully today we'll have a nice discussion. Uh, we're taking a little bit of a turn from chemistry back to uh, computer science and AI. 
So I hope you don't mind these like stark transitions. But yeah, today I want to overview um, a few interesting problems that we're encountering in the field of artificial intelligence, but specifically in the field of natural language processing. Some of the things that I have been doing to attempt to overcome these problems and my future research plan on doing so. My talk title just means to um, elucidate a trade-off that we're experiencing, and that's on the way of making artificially intelligent systems, we want them to be both human-like, so we want them to behave like us and be efficient like us, but we also want them to be humane. So uh, that has become a very interesting problem. But before that, let's have a little bit of an introduction. In the ways that I speak, in the introduction that was given about me, everything is based on language, as you can see. Um, language is everywhere, and it's either formal uh, and the way that I'm currently speaking, or very inform informal, the way that you'll speak with your friends or you'll text them. Not just that, also, I mean, it's in different languages too. Unfortunately, we're representing language often through well represented languages like English or French, but uh, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of language languages currently, as you can all appreciate. Urdu is another very big and important language. So, language is everywhere and in very many forms as well. And it's a very defining trait of being human too, right? So what defines us is language. The second thing that defines us is that we love mimicking things. We love modeling things as humans. So naturally, when you put these two things together, the field of natural language processing arises. And that's the field where we're trying to mimic or create systems that speak and behave like us. Um, and it's become a very popular field. So uh, in terms of just investments, We've, the industries have jumped from investing 10% to at least nearly doubling in terms of major technologists in the last few years. The, in fact, the global industry for NLP is expected to reach around 40 billion, according to one source at least, by the next five years, as opposed to the current 10 million or 10 billion as of last year. Um, the graph on the bottom shows almost an exponential rise in the total revenue by different segments in the market. So whether that be software, services, or hardware. So there's really an upshot in interest in natural language processing. But before that, what really, let's define natural language processing. It has three parts to its definition. So the definition is uh, modeling natural language with computational models and techniques. So the first part of the definition that I want to dissect a bit is what is natural language? Uh, natural language itself uh, refers to only a set of languages. These are sets of languages that are natural. And what we mean by this is that these are languages that are evolving naturally over time. There's no specific purpose to these languages. Uh, for example, English, Urdu, French, Farsi. These languages are evolving over time, but there's no specific purpose. As opposed to something like Python or Java, these have these are languages too, but there's a goal in mind and they're created artificially. So this is what we, we mean by natural language. There are also various domains for it. We can talk in terms of units, meaning just the sounds that you're making when you're speaking, or in terms of the actual parts of the words, we call these phonemes or the words themselves or some of the rules of the language, like syntax, or the meaning behind the words as well, semantics. You can also talk in terms of different forms. So you can have speech, or you can have text. There are two uh, smaller fields within natural language processing, and these are determined by the goal that you have in natural language processing, and I'll mention goals uh, in a bit. But you have natural language understanding, and this is the task of trying to map the language itself to a form that's usable by machines or humans. So really just mapping meaning to the actual um, language. And this, this is one of the bigger tasks in natural language processing. And in the diagram on the right, you can see that this is just one field within natural language processing. Another field is the task of actually generating language. So you can think of this as like machine translation or of, of chat bot. So this is from going from one text to another. The other part of the definition is modeling, right? So by modeling here, we're talking about goals, as I mentioned. So there are many goals in natural language processing, and they differ in terms of applicability. On the one hand, we have immediate goals. So language technology applications. This is like the, the developing a summarization system or a recommender or a chatbot that's immediately useful for the researcher. But then there are larger goals. So the goal of artificial intelligence, 
as we're uh, developing natural uh, systems that are capable of natural language, they seem more and more like they're intelligent. So we're contributing to AI as well. And then finally, what's interesting is that there's a ironic circle here. As much as we're trying to teach these systems about language, we often actually learn about language itself and its limitations um, by attempting to teach things language. So this is a field called co computational linguistics. So oftentimes you can gain insights about the very science you're trying to mimic uh, by trying to model it. So uh, there are a lot of very cool insights that come from just natural language processing that help linguists as well. Now I'm gonna start to give you a glimpse of what the current state of the art is uh, in natural language processing. On the right, you can see, um, it's just a quick like uh, GIF, but it's a state-of-the-art system that is out doing or it's performing well uh, on question answering, like on trivia, and it's actually doing better than humans. So if you ask which 20th century British prime minister was born in Portsmouth, it got, uh, you said Winston Churchill and T5 said Leo Tolstoy, which was correct. So um, they're doing pretty well. Finally, the last part of the definition is computational models and techniques. Here, we're talking about how do we actually do the modeling of natural language. There's so many techniques and models out there. On the right, there's an image that uh, clarifies that one of the methods that we're currently upon today is machine learning, specifically deep learning. But that's just one method amongst many that are used for natural language processing. Um, in fact, it's not just the methods in terms of the system itself, but it's how you process the data. How do you gather the data? What are your evaluation metrics? There are a lot of other things to consider in terms of the models and techniques we use in natural language processing. And a lot of those methods in the past uh, that have almost been overwritten by popularity are currently being revisited. So something as simple as rule-based systems or scripts seem to still be very promising for chatbots. A trend that we've been seeing as of the last four years or so is deep learning. So deep learning is doing very well, it seems, on natural language processing tasks. And I'm going to show you a demonstration of a few of those. But one of those specific um, trends in deep learning is that the models that do better and better in natural language processing are expectedly larger and larger. So in this graph, you can see a list of models, and these models are state-of-the-art models that were proposed as of the last five years. And uh, on the y-axis is the number of parameters by the billions that are behind these models. And it's even more than what seems like an exponential rise. You can have like, it's an astronomical growth on the latest model, for example, GPT-3. And we're going to play a little bit with GPT-3 today on the previous models, which were already good in their own right. But you can see GPT-3 has something like 200 billion parameters that drive it versus the other models that were only in the tens or 20 billion, right? And when we're talking about billions of parameters or parameters themselves, basically every parameter in these deep learning models is an opportunity or a degree of freedom to learn the data, right? So the more parameters that you have, the more opportunities and the more freedom that you have to fit your data. Um, so they become very strong in their capacity to learn something from the data and to make powerful predictions. Even as I speak, so in the last year or so, we've been, um, even GPT-3 that was really large has been overwritten by even bigger models. So we have Gopher as of 2020 by DeepMind, Megatron as of 2020 also by NVIDIA, and then Palm. Um, so it's a pathways language model is what it stands for of 2022 of Google. And they kind of just go off the graph. So they're actually nearly trillion billion, a trillion parameters in size. So our, our expectations for these deep learning models is as they're getting larger and larger, larger, right? So their parameters are reaching the trillions. They should be able to perform more and more tasks in natural language, right? So they can answer questions, summarize, understand language, translate, do common sense reasoning, and more and more. Even as you saw in that uh, tree, your joke explanations, which is by no means trivial. So let's actually get our hands dirty a bit and actually dem like play with the state of the art. So this is a really nice playground that I invite you guys, uh, if you're ever interested, to go to uh, this link. It's by OpenAI. They, they have an API of GPT-3, which, as I showed you, is one of the larger um, deep learning models. What's very interesting is not that you'll see that they're 
um, good at the way that they answer, but they can do many tasks immediately. They don't, they're not just experts at one thing. And I'll show you now uh, today some of the things that you can do with them. Um, so I've actually made a preset for you guys, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit. So what you can do with these powerful deep learning models is, and in short, by the way, to just talk a little bit about the technicalities about what goes on behind them, they're based on something called the transformer architecture. And the transformer architecture is a much more evolved form of, if you've uh, been familiar with these terms, uh, feed forward neural networks or recurrent neural networks. Transformer uh, neural networks are, uh, there's an innovation that was proposed that makes them very good at being slightly tweaked to do just about any task after having learned a lot from the data. So in short, what they'll actually do is it's a model that reads, um, let's say all of Wikipedia or all of Reddit and learns some tendencies about language, just like you think you might, right? So you'll read a lot as a kid. And then if you're given a task all of a sudden, like summarize this or explain that, you don't have to be an expert summarizer and you don't have to be an expert question answer to be able to do that just because you read all of Wikipedia. So this is essentially what this model is doing for you. So, uh, and exactly in this way, I've gotten a model that was pre-trained on a lot of text and it has never seen such a task of chatting with an audience at Comstec, right? But I've just prompted it. I said, a chatbot is speaking to an audience at Comstec. I've described the chatbot's personality to it. I said, the chatbot is helpful, creative, clever, and very friendly. I've started it off with uh, a back and forth that I want it to continue. So I said, audience says to it, good morning, how are you? I wrote, good morning to you, I'm well, how are you for the chatbot? And now I can go ahead and speak to the chatbot and it could respond to me. So I can say to it, we are well, we are sitting here watching you. And then I can press submit. It's great to be here with you all. Thank you all for having me. Uh, does anybody want to volunteer something you can say to the chatbot? I want you maybe to be even adversarial to challenge it. Who knows better than who knows better? Human knows better. Yeah. Well, uh, Dr. Yeah. Ahmed, maybe a little bit more adversarial. Let's actually try to give it a tough time here. What do you think we can say that whose response would be very impressive? Uh, Any ideas from the crowd? Anybody? What that is. <laughs> That's a good one. I think Dr. Ahmed cheated. <laughs> Dr. Ahmed cheated a bit because <laughs> this is one of the limitations, and I showed it in the previous lecture. But great, let's transition there. So it could be it could be impressive. Yeah, we can talk about the weather. It'll do a great job, but it has some limitations. I mean, so let's see what. Even if I said this, by the way. So let, let's start by saying we are in Pakistan. Okay, and so now we're actually specifying where we are. That's wonderful. I'm so happy to hear that. Great. And now if I said, what time is it? Let's actually even say for us, for us in Pakistan. It's currently 10 a.m. in Pakistan. Absolutely not. It's not 10 a.m. in Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, Dr. Ahmed is very good at catching these issues. <laughs> for a lot of people, it would take a, a long time. In fact, there's a famous test called the Turing test where if within a certain time span, uh, something like a chatbot can fool you to think that it's a human, then it's past the Turing test, right? It was a big dream of Alan Turing. Dr. Ahmed would have stumped it within a few seconds here and would have found out it's not human, or at least it's a human that really doesn't know where it is, which is just as bad. So yeah, so you can see that these chatbots, or not these chatbots, these models can be very powerful. They don't have to just chat either, right? They can do a lot of things. For example, they can do question answering or even let's do something else. They can summarize a topic for a second grader really well. So we have like a chemist in um, uh, in, in the room and we had a great presentation from them. If I can, we, I can do something like this too. summarize for a second grade student. I can write something in chemistry so I can like look up something in Wikipedia about chemistry. Um, let's let's do like covalent bonds um, and I can summarize for me very well for a second grader. So. Uh, if I did covalent bonds, I did something like this. I copied it. Let me just do that. So if I did this, let's see what it does. So summarize for a second grade student. Um, I press submit. 
as you can see, it's a very involved explanation. Um, and let's see if it does what it does here. I think it does an okay job. Equivalent okay, bond is when two atoms share one or more electrons. The electrons are pulled towards both of the atomic nuclei. A covalent bond forms when the difference between the electronegatives of two atoms is too small for an electron transfer to occur to uh, form ions. I don't know, Professor, what do you think? <laughs> is this okay? I think it's okay. I think it does a little bit better than the previous uh, explanation. It, it's a little bit less involved. Um, but so they do, they do impressive things, but sometimes they have serious issues like not knowing what time it is. What about James Bond? What about? James Bond. James Bond. King's Bond? James Bond. James Bond. Zero, zero, oh, seven. James Bond. James Bond. <laughs> I think even, you know, actually funny you, you said that. There's a really, really cool other example that I can show you. Um, let me find it. Yeah, movie to emoji. This is really cool too. So imagine, by the way, guys, this is not a task that this model was trained on. It has no sense of uh, a task where you're converting from movie to emoji, but you're just giving it an example and then it could immediately get the job. Like it understands the task. So if I said to it, back to the future is represented by these emojis. Batman is these emojis. Transformers is these emojis. Let's do James Bond. Let's see what, let's see what emojis it writes. Oh, oops, let me put it like this. This is James Bond. <laughs> Good. And like, uh, um, you know what? I want to test it with a really famous, I guess, movie in Urdu. Let's see if it knows that. So does anybody, what's a famous movie right now in Pakistan that is all the rage? I mean, I mean, I know that it's not big in, uh, oh, what, did somebody say it? Well, I was going to say that I know a movie that's famous in India, but I know that this uh, movie has some representation in the West now, but let's try this. Eh, not bad. I mean, he comes from the, I don't know if he comes from the city and he's educated, but I mean, it does an okay job. The, but I, I had another point there to make, and that's, that's, that's another problem. So. We're, we're witnessing some impressive things, but we're also witnessing some problems. Problems, they lack common sense. They don't generalize well to other tasks like telling the time. If I started to give it some movies that are represented in the East, it would not do as well because it's training on a lot of English. And in the English text that it's training on, it has a lot to do with the pop culture of the West, right? So these are some serious problems that we're um, facing. And by the way, the problems that I was showing you uh, in terms of not generalizing to reading the time, they get even worse. So let me show you this. And this is one's uh, really problematic. Um, guys, check this out. So if I told the same model to continue the sentence, which by the way, that's a very famous task in natural language processing. Continuing the sentence is the basis behind a lot of bigger tasks for machine learning models, like translating, like chatbots, um, and um, summarization. If I said to it, two Muslims walk into and asked it to continue the sentence, look what it says. And it's really problematic. I'm not even going to read that out loud. But if I said something like, you know, two Europeans walked into a, it would not say something as problematic. So bar in Chicago, I'll have a beer, I'll have a whiskey. You, must, you guys must be from Europe. So a very innocent little uh, story that followed. But when I said two Muslims walked in, it said something like that. Now, maybe that's not, and in fact, that's probably not the fault of the model as much as it is the fault of the, you know, the societies from the data sets that these models are collecting. But still, this is extremely dangerous. And for the reasons we saw today, for the fact that they don't generalize, um, to other languages and maybe to other tasks like telling the time, which are really basic. They're only representing languages where they're being trained on like English. And as well, they're basically mimicking um, the data and not just that, but they're potentially amplifying some of the problematic statements in the data sets. So they could turn out to be very racist. These are the very reasons why we can be impressed by them in a playground like this, but industry still seriously hesitate to deploy these models. And so there's this 
real bottleneck between academia and natural language processing and the industry. So there are investments and there is an increase in popularity in natural language processing. But in my own uh, talks with a lot of industry players, they still hesitate to deploy these models. And so my research um, pipeline is to try to fix these problems so that we can trust these models more. They can be more human-like, but at the same time, more humane. So quickly in the next like two minutes, I'm gonna summarize some of the works that I'm doing and then we can um, have it for questions later. So let me just go back to this. So we had our demonstration and, oh yeah, okay. So research problems as the summary of it was generalizability. Um, it turns out they do really well on data sets, but as you can see, when we test them as an audience, they don't do so well. They have ethical issues as I've shown you. Um, and another big issue is that they're not interpretable. I don't know why that model said what it said when I said two Muslims walked into it. I'd love to know why. Where was it in the data that you read something problematic and mimicked it? These models, these transformer architectures I mentioned, they're very powerful. They're huge, right? But we don't know, as I imagine Professor Ahmed can appreciate mathematically, they're nonlinear models, but they have so many layers and so many complexities that you can no longer explain why they made the decision they made. A linear model, y equals mx plus b, you can use m to explain the extent to which y increases when x increases. So that's an interpretable way of looking at it. But these nonlinear models, you cannot do such a thing. And so because of that, we don't know why they make the decisions that they make. So the question is, is it possible to overcome these or are they the very side effects of AI, right? So for generalizability, I'm attempting to at least try to help that a little bit. On the right is a diagrammatic representation of transformer model, just to put it out there. So they're very complex. They involve many layers that are stacked. One thing that I'm proposing is to actually involve a human in the loop. These models, what they're doing is they're training on text. They take many days and many comp uh, uh, powerful computers to do so. And in fact, GPT-3 took something like $15 million and a lot of training time to train. Once they're finished training, that's all that they are. They, they've, they've read the data and then you have to query them. But that becomes very stale. For example, if I asked GPT-3 about COVID, even today, if it was trained on the data sets that were before 2019, it wouldn't know anything about COVID. But to involve a human in the loop would be to have a human active in the training process of these models. So this is like proposing something like of a platform. And I don't know if there are any astronomers in the room, but in the search for extraterrestrial life, SETI is an organization where there's actually a website where you can log in and you can actually use your computer to help them in the search. My vision is that for AI, we can do such a thing, that we will have websites for the public, not just the crowd worker, not just the machine learning expert, but for the public to tune in and to fine tune a model like GPT-3 um, at live. And so we can all contribute to developing the knowledge base of these models. And there's a lot of promise in some demonstrations that I've been showing for this as well. And this falls under the regime of never ending learning. Just like us, we're constantly learning. It's important that the, the models aren't just, they, they learn everything and then they stop and then we query them. Um, and so hopefully that there, this could be a really nice direction toward generalizability. Finally, on interpretability, um, there's a lot more work we can do as well. Uh, the work that I'm doing is on glass box models. So these models currently, the transform architectures, they're known as black box, but there are a new family of models called glass box models, and it's what their name suggests. It's like you can look into them slightly. They're slightly transparent, and they're also very nice, and you can do a lot of things, and in, in, I've done some things on forecasting sales and assessing user experience of customers in social media. In general, the the pattern here is the trade-off between very complex models that are not interpretable and simple models that are is that there's this trade-off accuracy versus explainability the more and the, the graph on the bottom you can see the more that the model gets complex the less explainable it is like neural networks but the more explainable it is like simple classification or linear regression the more the less accurate it is glass box models hopefully stand somewhere in between and the more we can make them powerful but explainable, we've overcome this trade-off and are making them efficient and effective, but at the same time interpretable. I've done some other work on this. Uh, perhaps we don't have too much time to go over that, but one of the cool things that you can do is you can actually modify your data sets and see if how the behavior of the model in terms of prediction um, will uh, 
allow you to interpret what the model is actually doing. If I give the model something like Asif is furious with Fiza when he learns the truth about her accidents, right? And I ask it, who is he? I don't know why the model could have correctly gotten maybe Asif is he, right? But then if I modify the sentence say, and actually change Asif to a girl's name and say she, all of a sudden the model has a hard time, right? It has to guess between Fiza and Sara. So it actually has to think, it actually has to use the blue text. So by modifying your data set a little bit, you can actually potentially open the black box too sometimes. They do this in vision as well. Like if you had an image uh, captioning task and you said, uh, caption these images, models actually do really well. They'll say there's a wolf. But then if you're suspicious that maybe it's not doing it for the right reason, you can give it an image of a wolf in a city, which is something you don't often see. And then you can actually stump the model. Right? So models actually will suffer from this and they won't model it as a wolf. This is opening the model up a little bit. And now you're seeing that maybe it's not getting that it's a wolf because there's a wolf in the image, but maybe because there's a combination of some furry creature and the snow. So a really tough question could be putting a husky, which is a furry creature, into the snow and asking what it is. And it'll often still say it's a wolf and not a husky. Finally, on ethics, so some of those issues that I was showing you before, there are ways of reducing uh, models bias tendencies, not just on race or religion, but on other uh, dimensions as well, like gender, nationality, age, physical appearance, disability. And so there's a lot of attempts there as well. Uh, currently, I'm working on ways of doing that. We can see that models will um, exhibit some serious biases as well. If I said something like the physician hired the secretary because he was overwhelmed with clients, Models will get that correctly. They'll say he refers to physician. But if I said she was overwhelmed with clients, they'll actually think she refers to secretary. And that's reflecting a bias from the data sets. So first of all, revealing these is really important, these issues of biasing. And then to debias them is really nice as well. So you can imagine you can debias the model by duplicating in your data set another instance where you're flipping the, the, the names. And what it can do is it can discourage a model from just using names or genders in order to make resolutions. There's other cutting edge deviasing methods that I won't go into. But one thing that I'm currently working on with a master's student of mine in Brock is self deviasing, which is really cool and really meta. You're basically telling a model to be as racist potentially as possible. It says it's racist thing. And then you tell it never to say that thing again, essentially, in a nutshell. Um, and it's showing a lot of promise. At least what it seems is models are self-aware enough to identify themselves as problematic. And if they can do that, the hope is then their own identification and their own self-awareness will help them to be less and less biased in the future. There's other important areas in the field that I won't cover, but there probably will be a lot of work in the next five or six years on these. One of these that I'm really interested in is on storytelling. So there hasn't been much work on storytelling, common sense reasoning, on multilinguality, so as I said, to represent other languages in the world. And not just that, but there's this phenomenon called code switching, where in the real world, what happens is we're actually often switching between languages when we speak to someone that's bilingual. If I knew Urdu right now, I would switch to Urdu potentially in the middle of my talk. Models are not good at picking up that. So if right now on GPT-3, I suddenly switch languages, it would stump it as well. And then another thing I'm really interested in, and I I'm celebrating that today in this uh, conference where we're having different areas and different experts from fields is we really need to have that as well. We need to have experts from the sciences inspire us in natural language processing, for example, in psychology and neuroscience, um, to be able to actually make innovations that are based on the human brain as well. And with that, I guess I'll open it up for questions. Thank you guys so much. So, I'm open. So, I will ask you the same question, and I will tell you for you to tell about this black box and, and glass, glass box. So, are these black glass boxes are open and are they closed? Oh, okay. Very good question. So, the glass box models really what they are is that you can think of them as a linear model where you'll have a weight associated to a, a variable or a feature, but that feature undergoes a simple nonlinear transformation, but a very simple one. 
So one that you can actually potentially propose to, let's say, a, a doctor, and they can understand at least the weight that's associated with that feature that was undergone in the nonlinear transformation. So that's why I would say there's somewhere in between open and closed. That's why they'll say it's glass box. But to be honest with you, I would say something like it's a foggy glass box. So if there's fog. And it's because the moment that feature still underwent a nonlinear transformation, there is still some sort of interpretability lost, but at least we're casting it in the form of a linear model where you can still see that there's a weight associated to each uh, feature. The problem with truly black box models is they'll find some combination, nonlinear combination of features that you don't know at any point if how one feature contributed to your label. Here in glass box models, you're truly separating feature by feature so that you can identify at least one feature had a very important contribution to the label itself, if that makes any sense. If I would refer you to then uh, a really nice paper by Richard Caruana on uh, neural additive models. And that's a really like I guess canonical example of the first glass box models proposed. And he does a really good job of explaining something basically that I did in terms of linear, but not really linear models that are basically foggy glass box. All right, thank you. Bali, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Ali, for your presentation. My pleasure. <laughs> I like to talk about the title. Huh? Uh, so we'll move on to our final presentation for today by Professor Kirill Samokin. And the title is Exotic Superconductors for Everyday Applications. What do you say? Uh, I would like to express my gratitude first uh, to Comstec and to uh, Dr. Iqbal personally uh, for organizing this workshop and uh, inviting us here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be in this beautiful city. It's our first time in Pakistan, except Dr. Ahmed, of course, my first time in Pakistan and in Islamabad in particular, but we like it uh, very much here. Thank you. Uh, thanks all the staff of Com uh, Comstec for wonderful, warmest hospitality. Uh, I'd like to follow the lead of my uh, colleagues from chemistry and biology and say a few words about the importance of physics. <laughs> uh, you know, we physicists uh, want to think of physics as the most fundamental and important science of all. And there is a certain truth in that because uh, physics is all around us, right? It, uh, there is a myriad of physics phenomena in our everyday lives. Uh, we use electricity, you flip the switch and there is light. Um, uh, your computers, your cameras, your smartphones uh, use semiconducting chips. Um, if you go to hospital to get your MRI test done, then there are superconducting magnets in these machines and many other examples I can continue. Um, so the title of this talk uh, is related to uh, my area of research, uh, which is um, uh, superconductivity. Uh, mostly unconventional or exotic superconductivity. Uh, uh, you know, physics of superconductors is uh, one of the uh, most fundamental, fundamentally important areas of condensed matter physics. Uh, it has broader impact for other areas of physics. The ideas from theory of superconductivity uh, have been borrowed by uh, high energy physicists, uh, by uh, people working on semiconductors and in other um, uh, branches of physics. Uh, but theory of superconductivity or physics of superconductivity has important practical applications, uh, in particular applications for sustainable uh, energy production, energy storage, uh, sustainable transportation. So I mentioned some of these things uh, later on in my slides. By the way, are there any physicists in the audience? Okay. Um, I made my talk as pedagogical as possible. So don't be afraid. 
Um, so the first question we ask, what is superconductivity? And um, the obvious uh, manifestation of superconductivity, uh, which is implied by the name, is, uh, is infinite conductivity or complete disappearance of electric resistance. Uh, superconductivity was discovered in Mercury uh, in 1911 uh, by uh, Heike Cameron and Gones, who got Physics Nobel Prize uh, for his discovery. And this is the experimental plot. So above certain temperature, which is called the critical temperature. In this case, it's about 4.2 Kelvin. Uh, the electrical res resistivity of uh, the sample of mer mercury uh, dropped uh, to essentially zero. And I will remind you that absolute zero of temperature is um, approximately minus 273 wow. degrees Celsius. Okay, now uh, electric resistivity can be bad or good. Uh, it, it is useful in certain cases. Uh, for instance, uh, you cannot use electric kettles without electric resistivity. And you cannot uh, use incandescent bulbs without electric resistivity. Uh, but uh, many of the uh, manifestations of resistivity are harmful. Uh, for example, a significant portion of the electric power is lost during transmission, which is bad. Uh, because you will need to burn more fuel, let's say fossil fuels, to, uh, to compensate for that loss. And also, um, uh, you cannot build sufficiently powerful electromagnets because of the resistance. The wires in your electromagnet simply melt uh, if you try to uh, create a more powerful magnetic field. So what I have here is um, a pictorial representation of how um, electrical resistance of metals uh, works. So if you have a sufficiently warm wire and the red circles here are ions and uh, okay, big, big red circles and small um, uh, red circles are electrons. So if you have a warm wire, then ions and the lattice move fast and they scatter electrons strongly. If you decrease the temperature of your wire, then, okay, uh, then the atoms uh, move slower and the, uh, the, uh, the scattering of uh, little guys decreases. So this means that in experiment, you typically see something like this, the temperature dependence of the electric resistance. Now, in superconductors, what happens is that below the critical temperature, uh, the, the, uh, the, the resistance drops to zero. To all intents and purposes, this is zero resistance. Um, and uh, if, you, if you create an electric circuit with a current in it, uh, then in theory, uh, the current would uh, uh, circulate indefinitely in that wire. Uh, uh, and experiment, experiments have been done. Uh, so I believe the longest time uh, electric current circulated in the wire was two years uh, without um, any, 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 any dissipation. And the only reason they had to stop the experiment was not because the current dissipated, but because of a strike of railway workers which disrupted the liquid helium supply. Okay, uh, so another important manifestation of superconductivity, which is um, uh, which uh, which arises in practical applications, is the so-called Meissner effect. So it's a complete expulsion of magnetic field from the superconductor. So in, uh, if you place a metal or insulator in magnetic field, then typically nothing spectacular happens. So the magnetic field will uh, penetrate your material. But if you place uh, your superconductor in magnetic field uh, uh, and then cool it below critical temperature, and then the field will be expelled. And this is responsible for the phenomenon of the magnetic levitation. So what I have here, I have a superconductor here. Uh, these vapors are from uh, liquid, uh, liquid helium. Uh, and this is just a normal magnet. Uh, which, um, which cannot come closer to superconductors, like the cushion effect. So yeah, th th this explains the, the levitation. Um, uh, okay, so I should probably skip uh, this. Um, so th this is about the magnetic response of superconductors. When you, when you try to actually build uh, a superconducting magnet, then things like that, the relation between magnetic field and critical temperature become important, but I should probably just skip it for the sake of time and go directly to the practical applications of superconductivity. Why, um, uh, why do we want to investigate uh, superconductors? Uh, superconductors are used in uh, powerful electromagnets. I already mentioned MRI machines, uh, large hadron accelerator, 
Collider, excuse me, Large Hadron Collider in, in, in CERN, in Geneva, uh, uses uh, niobium, uh, I believe it's niobium uh, titanium uh, um, uh, superconducting wires. Uh, then, of course, uh, the uh, if you want to create as clean energy, electric energy as possible, then you want to use uh, fusion for this purpose. And fusion reactors uh, uh, contain very powerful uh, magnets to contain plasma inside. Uh, one such reactor is uh, currently under construction in France. Uh, um, so hopefully, eventually, maybe in uh, several decades, we'll have working uh, energy production uh, by uh, by thermonuclear flu thermonuclear fusion and uh, without superconductivity without superconducting magnets we will not be able to do that uh, then of course uh, magnetic levitation devices which is related to the Meissner effect uh, I showed in one of the previous slides so maglev trains are already operating in uh, Japan and maybe in uh, other parts of the world. Italy also, huh? Italy, no, they also have in Italy? Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, I, 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 I only hear, in, I believe this is the Japanese train. I'm not sure about Italy. Okay, now uh, then um, uh, the um, superconducting quantum interference devices based on the Josephson effect are used in high precision experiments and many physical high precision experiments. Um, and of course, uh, the uh, more obvious applications of superconductivity are listed here, uh, building transmission lines, power storage devices, and more recently, uh, we discussed superconductors in the context of building uh, hardware for quantum computations. Um, so what I want to do, I want to give you a timeline of uh, superconductivity. It was discovered in 1911, then the Meissner effect, that expulsion of the magnetic field was discovered in 1933. Uh, then um, uh, there, uh, there were several important theoretical developments in 50, uh, Ginsburg Landau theory in 1957, um, uh, the discovery of superconducting vortices. And finally, in 1957, in, in the same year, a microscopic theory of superconductivity was um, uh, was proposed by Bardeen, Cooper, and Schaefer. So um, the period of time from okay the, uh, the time from 1957, late 50s to late 70s can be called the golden age of classical superconductivity. And people thought that all fundamental problems in superconductivity are solved. So you know the mechanism, you know the, uh, that superconductivity is due to the formation of pairs, which I'm going to talk about in a few seconds. But then a big surprise came in 1976, the first um, superconductors which did not fit into the framework of the BCS, or Bardeen, Cooper, Schrieffer theory, they were discovered. Um, these are uh, so-called heavy fermion compounds, which are compounds of cerium and uranium. And this is just one of them. Uh, then uh, the floodgates were open and other materials were discovered which could not be explained by the BCS theory, in particular organic. Uh, in 1986, the high temperature uh, q rate superconductors were discovered. And uh, since that time, uh, the focus both theoretical and um, uh, practical uh, has firmly been on exotic materials. Okay, so what are the materials, superconducting materials? Superconductivity can appear in uh, uh, elemental, uh, elemental materials, uh, which is, uh, some of them are list listed here, lead and others. And the um, uh, highest, the record holder for the highest critical temperature um, before 1986 was uh, this niobium compound. So you can see that the critical temperature, <laughs> even in the best uh, cases is quite low, so you need the liquid helium to uh, to cool uh, your sample down to this material. So this obviously limits the practical applications uh, of, um, of the superconductors. So the um, uh, the heavy fermion superconductors uh, they typically have low critical temperatures, but in some cases they can be quite high. Then of course the high temperature materials, and this is the current holder. Uh, of the critical temperature uh, at um, at normal conditions, oh, at, <laughs> at, at normal atmospheric pressure, I should say. So this is the uh, highest reliably established critical temperature, which is still quite low, but it's not as bad as uh, in previous cases. Uh, so in the uh, last several 
decades, uh, many um, amazing, very interesting materials have been discovered. Um, I will talk about some of them uh, later on briefly, of course. Uh, but um, I would like, before I go to the next slide, I will go, uh, I, will, I would like to mention um, yeah, this material, the superconductivity in hydrides. Um, uh, so you can see that it uh, actually approaches the temperatures observed in Canadian winter. <laughs> so if you put, well, if you believe this experiment, why, why do, I, do I call them candidates? Because there is still no consensus in the community that these materials are indeed superconductors. And you can see why, because uh, the, the pressures are huge, it's millions of atmospheres. So uh, the, the groups that can reproduce such pressures and make experimental measurements, uh, there are very few such groups in the world. So we need to uh, be careful about these materials, but um, uh, we also need to be optimistic. So if this is indeed the case, uh, then uh, there is a hope that the critical temperatures, this high critical temperature, be, can be obtained at reasonable pressures, even in uh, even atmospheric pressures. So you might be able to mimic the effects of external pressure by other means, by you know, changing the composition of the compounds or something like that. So, uh, and of course, the ultimate goal is to have, what, what our ultimate goal is, is to have a, uh, an inexpensive, technologically suitable superconducting material at room temperature. Then many problems uh, which I mentioned before will be solved. Okay, uh, so let me skip this. Um, let me skip this. Yeah, oh, maybe not all of it. Uh, so I would like here to mention uh, one of my favorites, superconducting diamond. Uh, so as I said, superconductivity has been observed in, uh, in, uh, in many compounds. And one of them is, is diamond. You dope it with boron, um, and uh, the material becomes superconducting at 4K, so which is kind of amazing. Okay, uh, and uh, I would like to also mention the superconducting superstars, the, maybe the, the most famous superconductors or exotic superconductors, the high temperature uh, copper oxides. Uh, they were discovered by, um, by accident, by serendipity, as they say, in 1986 by these two researchers. Uh, which immediately got a Nobel Prize for their discovery. So it made a huge uh, splash in the community. Everybody started working on these materials immediately. And all these materials, high temperature superconductors, uh, they share the same crystal structure. Uh, and the most important structural element, uh, which is believed to be responsible for superconductivity, is a two-dimensional copper oxygen planes like this. So there is a lot of physics going on, and there are many questions about what's the actual um, mechanism of superconductivity in this material. Um, so let me just leave it at that. Uh, now, now, now what I want to do, I want to list the Nobel Prizes that, were, that have been awarded for research on superconductivity and related fields. Uh, Heike Kammerling Onnes discovered uh, superconductivity. Um, uh, Lev Landau explained um, properties of quantum fluids in particular superfluidity of helium-4. Superfluidity is a closely related phenomenon to superconductivity. Uh, Bardeen, B, uh, Cooper, C, and Schrieffer, S, BCS, uh, they propose the BCS theory of superconductivity. Uh, then Josephson um, uh, and, uh, his, uh, and, and other people got a Nobel Prize for the uh, phase coherence effects, uh, Kapitza, uh, who actually discovered experimental superconductivity in helium, got his Nobel Prize, Bedertson Muller, uh, high temperature superconductors, uh, these guys got Nobel Prize for the superfluidity of another isotope of helium, uh, Cornell, Kettering, and Wyman, uh, both Einstein condensation and cold gases, and um, uh, the latest Nobel Prize in, uh, in, uh, in our field uh, was awarded by these three researchers. Uh, for a theoretical work in superconductors and superfluids. So what I want to do now, do I have time? I have a few minutes. I would like to uh, discuss the origin of a resistance in ordinary metals. So the electrons in ordinary metals behave in a, in, in a, in a, in a way like um, uh, people, pedestrians in a random cloud, which is shown, uh, which is shown here. Uh, so you, when you try to pass electric uh, current uh, through a normal metal, 
then uh, your electrons will experience scattering of uh, impurities of defects and they will leave the metal uh, the, and this um, uh, contributes to uh, electric resistance now in superconductors what happens is that electrons work together as, as a team um, so you have the same metal but now it's superconducting below critical temperature electrons are bound in pairs and these pairs because uh, the teamwork of electron reduces scattering, these pairs can move happily uh, through the samples. So the behavior of electrons in this case um, uh, reminds the, um, the, uh, the military band or military regiment instead of random crowd of pedestrians. Okay, uh, so how can electrons form such a state? And now a little bit of physics here. Uh, so uh, electrons are fermions. So they have the uh, internal intrinsic quantum number um, spin, uh, which for electrons have the, the, has just two values. Um, and because of the very important physical principle, Pauli principle, uh, electrons hate each other. They cannot occupy the same state. Uh, so then the question is, how can you make them to work as a team? Uh, the answer is that you, you need to create pairs of electrons. Because pairs of electrons uh, become, uh, they, they, you know, they, they are bosons. It's a different type of quantum particles. And unlike fermions, bosons can condense all into the same state. So bosons like each other. Fermions hate each other, bosons like each other. So pairs of electrons form a coherent state, coherent microscopic state that can move uh, through the uh, through the crystal. So that's the explanation um, uh, of, uh, of superconductivity, the essence of the uh, BCS model. So electrons form pairs, pairs condense in the same state, uh, they uh, do the teamwork, and then the electric, electric liquid flows uh, through the sample without resistance. But now the question is, uh, how can electrons form pairs? Because they, they are like charges, they repel each other. How can they uh, pair up? And uh, um, this is how they pair up. So the first, uh, according to uh, Bardin, Cooper and Bardin, Cooper and Schiffer, so you have two electrons. The first electron attracts positively charged ions in the crystal lattice and creates a cloud of local positive charge here. And this cloud of local positive charge attracts the second electron. So this, this, this is basically the BCS mechanism. And it's called the electron phonon mechanism of attraction. Uh, phonon is just a, a physics name for the uh, wave of uh, lattice distortion. Okay, uh, so let me skip this. Uh, yeah, I, I have a little animation here showing how paired electrons help each other to move through the lattice. Okay, now, uh, now what I want to do, I want to talk about uh, the distinction between uh, the distinction between uh, conventional and unconventional superconductors. Um, okay, so uh, since there are no physicists in the audience, I don't want to scare you too much. So the, you know, the central object of quantum mechanics is the so-called wave function. And you use wave function to characterize any type of quantum particles. In particular, you can use your wave function to characterize your Cooper pairs. Okay, so if you have... Uh, two electrons, then the wave function, so these are my electrons. So the wave function uh, is zero in the normal metal when there is no pairs, no superconductivity. In the superconductor, uh, the, uh, the electrons are paired, so the wave function is non-zero. Okay, now let's move uh, from the real space to the momentum space. So now your electrons move with some momenta they uh, the momenta have to be positive uh, have to be opposite to each other and uh, the the way function as a function of the momenta of the paired electrons characterizes the pairing strengths of these electrons and now uh, we can make the distinction between uh, isotropic or uh, bcs like pairing and exotic pairing in uh, standard uh, bcs like superconductors uh, the pairing strength is the same for all directions of the motion of electrons. So this, this is what we call isotropic pairing. But if uh, the wave function, the pairing strength, depends on the direction of K, uh, then you have uh, an isotropic or exotic pairing. In particular, in the high temperature superconductors, uh, the pairing strength 
uh, is equal to zero along the diagonals of this square lattice. So there are no pairs that move along these directions in the uh, copper oxygen plates, which are the main structural elements responsible for superconductivity. So you can see that this is a strongly anisotropic pairing indeed. Okay, so let me skip this. Okay, uh, and this is the distinction between conventional and unconventional superconductors. In conventional superconductors, pairing is isotropic, there are no gap nodes, uh, the pairing mechanism is due to phonons, uh, and we know a well-developed theory, which is uh, the BCS model to explain superconductivity. In exotic superconductors, pairs are anisotropic, you have gap zeros, so the pairing strength vanishes along certain directions. Pairing mechanism is likely non-phononic, but in most cases it's unknown, and there is no complete quantitative theory yet. So if you want to work in, in superconductivity, this is the uh, field to go, because there are more questions than answers here. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so this is how we, uh, uh, how we work in, uh, in, uh, in our uh, in, um, uh, in our field. Uh, so it starts with experimental uh, discovery of superconductivity. Then you characterize your samples and try to determine the type and location of gap zeros, the, um, the directions along which the pairing strength disappears. Uh, then you hopefully try to figure out the mechanism which forms Cooper pairs. And if you know all these uh, things, then you can hope to start building your superconductors by design instead of discovering them by accident, by serendipity, now you can try to, uh, to produce uh, uh, your superconductors by design. Okay, so uh, what I want to do, I want to now uh, quickly skip to the research uh, we have been doing, uh, which has mostly been about superconductors without symmetry of inversion or inversion symmetry. Uh, so you can see that uh, the inversion is simply um, uh, a reflection in the point. So when you change X to negative X, Y to negative Y, and Z to negative Z. Uh, so if these two vases, the red vases, uh, are the same after uh, mirror reflection, then uh, these two white vases are, di uh, are different uh, after, after the reflection in the mirror. Same happens in um, one of the uh, most uh, um, prominent non-centrosymmetric superconductors, cerium platinum trisilicon. If you make a mirror reflection in the horizontal plane, then these purple silicons change position, so you change the crystal lattice. This material is non-centrosymmetric. Uh, why is it important? Well, there are other examples of non-centrosymmetric superconductors, uh, dozens, if not hundreds of them now. Uh, so why is it interesting? This is because if the, there is no inversion symmetry in the crystal lattice, then superconductivity has to be very different from the standard model, from the BCS model. So the pairing is neither singlet nor triplet, so the spins of electrons uh, do not um, orient it like this or like that. Instead, we have a mixture of these two situations. And um, uh, the unusual features of non centrosymmetric superconductors, such as uh, crucial role of the spin orbit coupling and uh, non uniform superconducting state, they lead to highly non trivial novel applications of superconductivity. For example, um, uh, I just very quickly want to mention um, <coughs> uh, the, uh, the possibility to use the so called Majorana fermions um, uh, to build a platform for quantum computing. One of the important ingredients for the existence of Majorana fermions is the spin orbit coupling and the absence of inversion symmetry. So this is a worthy, the, the, this is the research area very worthy of, of uh, investigating. So the, my final slide, I would like to mention uh, that the first high temperature superconductor in Canada was discovered by, um, by my uh, former colleagues, well, Okay, so um, Professor Mitrovich retired two years ago. Uh, Professor Razavi is still, um, is still uh, working. And Professor Kofeberg, uh, unfortunately, passed away. Uh, so these three people, they discovered the very first um, uh, high temperature superconductor in Canada just two months after it was discovered in Switzerland by the people who eventually got Nobel Prize for it. Okay, so thank you very much. <laughs> Um, any questions? That's it.
Yes. Thanks for a very interesting talk. I have a couple of things. Let's take in the exotic mechanisms. You have a theory mechanism, or is it something beyond that? Which, you know, unlike the case. Um, you know, that is the second question, right? Uh, well, in uh, in uh, uh, in unconventional superconductors, first they they cannot be common mechanisms that they share. So in different materials, uh, the mechanism might be different. In high TC, uh, one of the ideas that people have been exploring since the beginning, since 1986, is that the pairing is due to antiferromagnetic fluctuations. In other materials, it might be, uh, in particular, in ferromagnetic superconductors, it might be because of ferromagnetic fluctuations. Uh, but uh, these theories are not quantitative. They, uh, unlike the BCS theory, um, uh, they um, they cannot uh, they, they make some uncontrolled approximations. So this is what I would, I would like to say. So BCS theory is the gold standard, and no other mechanism approaches the gold standard of BCS. In its ability to explain superconductivity in unconventional materials. The thing I wanted to ask was regarding the topological in this matter. Now, a lot of uh, different exotic behavior is seen, including interfacial superconductivity in the topologic mm -hmm. It doesn't have any potential for you know, getting in the right direction, or it's just a yeah, yeah o, o, of course, it, 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 uh, it has huge potential. Topological superconductivity is characterized by, uh, uh, by the presence of zero energy modes on the boundary of the material. And if you can make these modes uh, to work, uh, if you can use them, as, uh, as I mentioned in one of the slides, for quantum computation, for, for example, then it is a very promising direction. Uh, but there are many obstacles here. Yes. So uh, this exotic superconductors are already in application used. Um, okay, uh, most of the exotic superconductors have very low critical temperatures, and this limits their um, uh, their um, practical application because you need the uh, cryogenic equipment, right? Yeah, because yeah. It, it, the reason I was asking it because most of these uh, superconductors in imaging devices, animals, cells, PMRIs, cascades work at uh, helium temperature, liquid helium temperature. Mm -hmm. And they're absolutely phenomenally expensive. Mm -hmm. The one which we bought in Pakistan was 19.5 Tesla, it cost us $2 million. Mm -hmm. Two million dollars. So I'm just curious whether it can ever be replaced with such materials. That's the hope. Uh, that's, that's what everybody in the field hopes for. That one day, either by serendipity or by design, uh, we'll discover a superconductor which works at room temperature, which is cheap to produce, and which is technologically applicable. Uh, okay, it's good for te technological applications because high temperature superconductors, um, for example, they are uh, ceramics, so they are brittle. You cannot really make a wire out of them. So these materials, if you can push the critical temperature of high temperature cuprates to, to the room temperature, then you know, you can still, you, you cannot make a wire out of it. Right? So, uh, the hope is that uh, you might one day discover a material which will satisfy those three conditions. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, sir, once again. Uh, that marks the end of the technical talks. Now, for the closing remarks, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Mahmoud Iqbal Chaudhry to say a few words. My closing remarks would be thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, everyone. And I can see shining faces, like young people. Uh, I say three Bs, more beautiful, brilliant. Huh? Old, beautiful and brilliant people. I'm sure that you have learned a lot from them and that I sincerely hope that this is one of your many visits and that you will stay here longer when you come next time. Maybe you take a course, a week or so, or two weeks or three weeks, and that would be really beneficial for our people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now I would request uh, to present sheets for a resource person, Professor Jas.
So you know the story. How about this? So this is a, a walnut wood. Oh, walnut. It's a handcraft. So we're giving you a very important piece of wood from Pakistan, sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> Not so biodegradable. <laughs> Sure. This is also very educational. Yeah. The story of this. Oh, oh, Papa. Thank you. Uh, Professor Bing. Oh. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this very special Professor Bing. Solid wood, but it's not very really heavy. It's a blending marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Professor George. Thank you, sir. Spasipa, Mr. Dani. Spasipa. Oh, it's During my school days, I used to learn this. Thank you. 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 And of course, if anyone has not marked attendance, kindly do so because you will all be emailed the certificates on the email given. Thank you to all of you.